The Honorable Judge Stephen Everett presiding. Good morning, everyone can be seated. How are the jurors doing with the potty situation? Uh, significantly better than they have. I would like to hear. <laughs> All right, is Ms. Adelson present? All right, if someone can bring her in so she can take the witness box. Judge, would you like me at the podium now? Or? You can wait. For everyone in the gallery, once again, if you were not present yesterday, so you understand the instruction, once the testimony has begun, if you leave the courtroom, you will not be readmitted until the witness completes their testimony. Please also silence your phones. Yes. You won't have to be sworn again. You remain under oath. Let's bring in the jurors. Better take this cough drop while I have the chance. Ms. Dugan is concerned about my voice. What, one, one minute, one minute. <laughs> Hey, 
Everyone can be seated. Good morning, members of the jury. We are going to resume with the cross-examination of Ms. Adelson at this time. Mr. Rauschbaum, you may examine when you're ready. Thank you, Your Honor. motion was denied okay you understood that you couldn't leave Tallahassee after it was denied right that's right and so you decided to build a life here with your boys right I mean I had been building a life here for seven years before that but to continue with my life yes you had a large circle of friends I did yeah you were in a book club I was um, in fact, on July 1, 2014, just 17 days before the murder that the state thinks you participated in, do you recall that you were excited that a friend of yours was moving to Tallahassee? I do. Do you remember that friend's name? I can refresh your memory if you need it. Well, I think Renee Griggs was planning on moving to Tallahassee. May I approach your honor? You may. I'm showing you for identification purposes only, Defense Exhibit 3. Is that your email? Yes, that's my email. And is that your email with Ms. Griggs? Yes, it is. Judge, I offer into evidence right now, Defense Exhibit 3. Any objection from the state? Hearsay, Your Honor. What is the exception that you're offering us on? State of mind. Please provide it to the court. You learned on July 1 that your friend Miss Griggs was moving to Tallahassee, right? Well, I learned she was interviewing for a job in Tallahassee. And you thought that was a dream come true, right? I was really excited about it. Why was it a dream come true? To be able to be with her all the time would be fantastic. You were dating men that lived in Tallahassee, right? I was. One of those men was Jeff Lacoste. That's right. We'll talk about him a little more later, but you dated him the end of 2013 through June, July 2014? That's right. And after you broke up with him, do you recall joining a, a date, couple date sites, uh, I websites? Did. I don't think they're called date sites, but dating websites? Yes. Okay. Uh, do you recall uh, setting up dates for the week or so after July 18th? I did. And do you recall having emails with individuals setting up those dates? I do. Do you recall setting up those dates? on July 16th, 2014, for two weeks later? That sounds right. Do you recall setting up dates on July 17th for around two weeks later? That sounds right. Now, yesterday, Ms. Kappelman talked about a house you did not buy. <clears throat> Uh, in 2013. You recall that testimony? I do. Let's now talk about 2014. In the spring and summer of 2014, you were working with a local realtor to buy a house in Tallahassee, right? 
I was. I'm showing you what's marked as defense exhibits six and seven. Do you recall in April of 2014 looking at a property on Beard Street? I do. Do you recall in June of 2014 uh, looking at 40 open houses that are available in Tallahassee? I do. Judge, I would move these exhibits into evidence as well. Well, here's a with the exception you're offering them under once again. State of mind, rehabilitation. Jade Depart Frog Realty, your broker? Um, he was a different realtor I was using. I used a couple different people, but I heard he was good, so I had reached out to him about um, this particular property. Okay. And that was in April, 20, April 25th, 2014. That's right. And that's about I think, four weeks before the first attempted murder in June, correct? I don't know about the first attempted murder. And if you weren't able to buy, you were going to rent, right? I would have continued renting. Do you recall speaking to a Leslie Andrews on July 7th about a rental? I don't remember Leslie Andrews, um, but it's on, I mean, I had a main real estate person I worked with, so she would have been maybe someone who had a property I was interested in, but I, I don't remember. Do you remember something called the Tallahassee Center? I don't. Judge, may I approach with uh, Defense Exhibit 8 for identification purposes only? And see if this refreshes your recollection that you were looking to rent a one bedroom lease and this is from July this email is from July 7th 2014 but you said I was looking to rent a one bedroom <laughs> and she offers me a one bedroom but I say I need something bigger right so that doesn't work Nonetheless, you were looking to rent. You were in the rental market just 11 days before the murder occurred, right? That's right. In July of 2014, you planned for the boys to attend school in Tallahassee in the fall, right? 
we were trying to figure out which school our older son would go to and our younger son probably would have kept going to the same preschool in fact you and professor markel were arguing about that right we hadn't come to a decision yet but you wanted the the boys to go to uh, i think they call it sas um, we had put our older son in the lottery and he got pulled for it and so we were exploring it as an option and that was the lottery for the school year 2014 and 2015 right so you didn't expect him to go to school in miami no May I have one moment, Your Honor? Go now, um, in early 2013, you were appointed a clinical professor by the FSU faculty? That's right and you were continuing to handle immigration and disability cases around Tallahassee? That's right. And you had plans to teach at the law school in the fall of 2014? Yes. Fall of 2014 meaning after the murder, after when your ex-husband was murdered, correct? correct? You were talking to research assistants about working with you, right? Yes. Do you recall speaking to a research assistant about working for you possibly in the fall of 2014? Sure, that sounds right. Uh, do you recall uh, Z. Nolan? Mm hmm I do. And you offered them a job in the summer and they couldn't take it? And you said, well, come back to me in the fall. Do you recall that? I do. And in the spring of 2014, uh, well, let me back up. You authored a book, correct? I did. In the spring of 2014, your book was selected by FSU for what was called the One Book, One Campus event, right? That's right. That means that your book was going to be required reading for all incoming freshmen at FSU. That's right. Uh, and that means that we're talking about the incoming freshmen after the summer of 2014, right? I was supposed to speak at um, convocation in August. Let's talk about that in a second. But before we get there, that was a big honor for you, right? It was the highlight of my career. Okay. And uh, you were very excited about it. I was super excited. Uh, you were going to be the keynote speaker at the FSU convocation on August 24th, 2014, correct? That's right. Okay. Um, you told your friends and family about it. I did. I probably told everyone. <laughs> you told your parents about it for sure. I did. And you told Charlie about it. I'm sure I did, yeah. Okay. I'm going to show you Defense Exhibit 12 and 13. Take a look at these and let me know if you recognize them. Let me know if it's your email. This is my email. You recognize these items? I do. Judge, I move Defense Exhibit 12 and 13 into evidence. Can I see these items, please? Sure. You have them. Here, say in relevance, Your Honor. May I approach, Your Honor? State of mind. Stay 
Judge, may we go sidebar, please? Do you recall that your parents and Charlie were quite excited to come watch you in Tallahassee at this event they in were. August? Yes. Do you recall your brother saying he couldn't wait to book a ticket, that it was fucking awesome? Yeah, he was very excited. Do you recall discussing with Professor Markell who would have custody of the boys during various trips in August and September of 2014? Yes. Do you recall having those discussions in July of 2014? That would make sense, yeah. Do you recall scheduling a whole host of meetings after July 18th, 2014? Yes. Let me be more precise. Before July 18, 2014, do you recall scheduling a bunch of meetings that were to occur after July 18, 2014 in Tallahassee? Yes. Do you recall making plans with a friend moving to Tallahassee for July 25th, 2014? I don't. Let me see if I can refresh your memory. Do you know an individual named Tahira Lee? I do. May I approach your, your honor with yes. defense exhibit 15? I would direct you to the email on June 17, 2014, which I think is the fourth email on the first page, and see if that refreshes your memory. But feel free to look at the whole document. Um, I see it, but you were asking if they were moving to Tallahassee on the 25th, or if I... No. no. Um, did you... Okay, sorry. I'll, I'll repeat the question. Okay. Do you recall... Uh, making plans with her where you said you would make plans with her after August 25th 2014 because your family was coming to town yes and 
that happened, that correspondence was in late June of 2014? Yes. Do you, ex do you recall in June, you can put that aside now. Okay. Do you recall in June of 2014, late June of 2014, expressing interest in joining the board of a Tallahassee-based child advocacy nonprofit called American Children's Campaign? I do. That was in Tallahassee, right? Mm -hmm. Do you recall scheduling a meeting for July 23rd, 2014 with a professor Van Dern with the FSU College of Medicine? So I, I don't, but okay. I ran a medical legal partnership. So I, I would have been setting up meetings with the medical school, with the law school, with the social work school. So that would have been normal, but I, I don't remember it specifically. May I approach your honor? Does this refresh your recollection that you were scheduling a meeting with Professor Van Duren for July 23rd of 2014? Yes. Do you recall schedule? You can put that aside. Okay. Do you recall scheduling a meeting with your divorce lawyer to meet any time of the week of July 21, 2014? Again, I don't remember specifically, but it sounds like it would have been made sense for the time. Do you know an individual named Cindy Jean? I do. Do you remember emailing her and asking her if the kids were available to go swimming at the pool on July 19th to 20th? I don't remember, but it sounds like something I would have asked. May I approach your honor with defense exhibit 20 for identification purposes only? Does this refresh your memory about trying to set up that play date for July 20th or July 19th with Ms. Jean? Yes. You can put that aside. Do you recall that your mom planned to visit Tallahassee in November of 2014? I don't remember that. Showing, may I approach your honor with uh, Defense Exhibit 21 for identification purposes only? You may. Okay, please take a look at this. Yes. Does this refresh your memory that you're Parents planned on being in Tallahassee on November 17th. Does that yes. refresh your memory? Mm -hmm. You can put that aside. Do you recall asking uh, your parents to come to Tallahassee on August 1, 2014, for a birthday party with Ben? For Ben? I don't remember doing that, but that sounds. It's close in time to his birthday. May I approach your honor with defense exhibit 22? You may. Does this uh, refresh your recollection that you were going to have a birthday party for Ben in Tallahassee in early August of 2014? That's right. You can put that aside. And that your parents were going to come up for that? Mm -hmm. 
Do you recall making flight reservations to travel to Newark and then back to Tallahassee? So you're going to leave from Tallahassee and come go to Newark, come back to Tallahassee for a wedding in October 2014. I do. And you made those reservations in July of 2014. Do you recall that? I don't recall when I made the reservation, but I remember the wedding. May I approach your honor with Defense Exhibit 23? Does this refresh your recollection that the reservation was made sometime around July 14th, 2014? Yes. That you were booking tickets for a wedding in New Jersey in, on October 24th, 2014? Yes. And the cost of those tickets were over $400, right? That's right. You put that aside. Those tickets weren't to go back to Miami, were they? No, it was Tallahassee to Newark, Newark to Tallahassee. Why did you, why did you make those tickets to go back to Tallahassee? That is where I lived. <laughs> we're going to move on to another subject. Ms. Kappelman talked a little bit yesterday about the uh, litigation that occurred after the relocation litigation with Professor Markell. You recall that? I do. And there were these pieces of litigation back and forth um, about money and about filing false affidavits. You remember those? Yes. It was what was called uh, the motion against uh, your mom that Professor Markell filed. You recall that, right? I do. With regards to the motion that Professor Markell filed claiming that you and your attorney filed a false affidavit, did you get the sense that you were going to prevail on that litigation? Yes. Was the judge getting frustrated with Professor Markell on that litigation? Very. Did the judge admonish Professor Markell regarding that litigation? The judge said he needed to stop. Were you concerned about getting disbarred? No. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about Jeff Lacoste. You first met Mr. Lacoste in the fall of 2013? Yes. It was casual at first? It was. You were dating other people as well? I was. It got more serious around March of 2014? That's right. He was in, fair to say he was in love with you? I'm, I don't really remember. I don't think I could say, but it was more serious. Okay. You weren't so sure about him, is that fair to say? I think my feelings developed over time. And then they undeveloped? And then they undeveloped. <laughs> you were very different people from very different backgrounds, right? Yeah. He didn't spend much time with your parents, right? I think maybe he met them once. He wanted to meet them more than once, right? He didn't like that he didn't get to see them more times. I think he wanted to be more integrated into my life. Jeff Lacoste met Charlie Adelson uh, one time in March of 2014, right? That's right. He accompanied you on a trip with law students, right? I used to run an alternative spring break, and he came with me. And you decided to uh, visit, uh, come down to South Florida for a day or two, right? That's right. And you had dinner at a place called Yardbird, right? That's right. Are you aware that that happened on March 11th, 2014? No, I don't remember the date, just that it was during the spring break. 
Fair enough. Um, you remember sitting outside on the patio? I do. And it was you and Mr. Lacoste and Charlie and a woman named Catherine Magbanawa. Do you recall that? That's right. Who was Charlie's girlfriend at the time? Yes. Are you aware that Sigfredo Garcia was watching you at that dinner? No. Are you aware that he was contemplating running your brother over with his car at that dinner? No. After dinner, you and uh, Jeff Lacoste um, stayed at Charlie's house, right? We did. Miss Magbanawa wasn't there, right? I don't remember her being there. It was just the three of you? I think so. And you left the next morning? We did. Now, you and Mr. Lacoste started having issues around May of 2014, is that fair to say? That sounds about right. Uh, you started to become nervous around him? I don't really remember if I was nervous around him, but I started thinking it wasn't the right relationship. He started accusing you of being unfaithful, right? He did. He accused you of having an affair with someone that you had previously dated? He did. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. You told him that you didn't. You denied it. That's right. And he didn't believe you. He did not. And uh, before this individual that you used to date, you had coffee with at a place called All Saints in Tallahassee, right? I did. And Mr. Lacoste saw you having coffee with this individual, right? He did. And that caused a confrontation. Is that fair to say? He flew into a rage. Subsequently, he went through your phone and planner, right? He did. And this is around May, June of 2014? That's, that sounds right. And uh, you and, and Mr. Lacoste went to Gainesville for a weekend for his work at some point around this time frame? Yes. And that Saturday night, June 28th, he basically exploded at you. He did. He yelled at you for hours. He did. He accused you of having affairs with multiple people. He did. Uh, you were very upset, to say the least. I was devastated, yep. Now, you were scheduled to leave for South Florida, I believe it was on June 30th or June 29th to celebrate your dad's 70th birthday, right? That sounds right. And Mr. Lacoste wasn't invited? No. You went down to South Florida on June 30th, and you and the boys stayed with your parents, right? We did. You had the boys with you the whole time? Yes. Dan Markell didn't have the boys at that point in time. The boys were with you? Yes. And Charlie knew that, right? Yes, he was with us. Your mom planned a, a big party for the birthday? She did. <clears throat> I think when Ms. Kappelman asked you if the birthday fell on a Saturday, you weren't sure. I remembered it being on his actual birthday, which I thought was a Saturday, but I, I don't remember the calendar from 2014. May I approach your honor with Defendant's Exhibit 25? Ms. Adelson, does this refresh your recollection that July 5th, 2014 was on a Saturday? Yes. And that the party was at 7.30 p.m. or yes. thereabouts? Mm -hmm. Put that aside. Now, when you got back to Tallahassee, you saw Mr. Lacoste on July 13th? That sounds right. And um, when you saw him, it was not a good meeting. Is that fair to say? It's uncomfortable. Yeah. You saw him the next day at a yoga studio? 
I went to yoga and he wanted to come. And uh, it was awkward? It was. And kind of tense? It was. And he asked to see you again later that week? He did. And you didn't want to? I did not. And when you got home that night, you sent him an email asking him not to contact you for at least seven days that you wanted to think things over. Is that I fair did. to say? Yes. You never saw him again, right? No. Are you now aware that there was a first attempt on your ex-husband's life on June 4th and June 5th, June 4th, 5th of 2014? Yes. <clears throat> when you lived with Professor Markell on Trescott, was your address publicly listed? I believe so. I have one moment, Your Honor. Judge, at this point in time, we'd ask a stipulation be read into evidence. First stipulation. The stipulation regarding the drop-off pickup schedule for the Markel children. Very well. Do you need a copy, Your Honor? I have it right here. I'm just bringing up instruction 2.3. Members of the jury, when the parties agree that certain facts are true, that is called a stipulation of fact, you must accept stipulated facts as having been proven. However, the significance of these facts, as with all facts, is for you to decide. In this case, the stipulated facts that you must accept are true are the Markell children were enrolled at Creative Preschool located in Tallahassee. During the week of July 14th, 2024, their drop-off pickup schedule was as follows. Monday, July 14th, 2024, dropped off at 8.55 a.m. by Dan Markell, picked up at 5 p.m. by Dan Markell. Tuesday, July 15th, 2014, Dropped off at 8.25 a.m. by Dan Markell. Picked up at 4.50 p.m. by Dan Markell. 
Wednesday, July 16th, 2014. Dropped off at 9 a.m. by Dan Markell. Picked up at 4.30 p.m. by Wendy Adelson. Thursday, July 17th, 2014. Dropped off at 8.30 a.m. by Wendy Adelson. Picked up at 4.45 p.m. by Dan Markell. Friday, July 18th, 2014. Dropped off at 8.50 a.m. by Dan Markell. Thank you, Your Honor. So I want to first focus your attention on the July 17, 2014 schedule. On July 17, 2014, <coughs> as Your Honor just recited, you do you recall dropping the kids off at school at 8.30 in the morning? Yes. And Professor Markell picked them up at 4.45 p.m. on that day, thereabouts, or thereabouts. Which I just heard, but I wouldn't have known what time. You didn't pick them up that I day? Did, no, it wasn't my day. So it would be impossible, the person would be wrong if they said that they saw you and the kids by Professor Markell's house in the afternoon or morning of July 17, 2014, correct? It would be some other woman and some other kids. You spoke to your mom probably close to daily, right? Yeah. During this time period. She would know when you had the kids and didn't have the kids, right? Probably. I want to go back to something briefly that we talked about yesterday before we stopped. You knew that Professor Markell posted his travel plans on Facebook and on his profs blog, right? Yes. He would talk about places and conferences that he was speaking at, right? He would. Are you aware that on the weekend of the 20th, he was speaking, he was supposed to speak at a conference in New Jersey and he posted it on Prof's blog as well as on Facebook. Yes. Let's talk a little bit about Best Buy. May I approach, Your Honor? You may. I'm showing you what's marked for identification purposes only as Defense Exhibit 29 and 30. Looking at Defense Exhibit 29, does that uh, refresh your recollection that the warranty was under your father's name for yes. that TV? Mm -hmm. A warranty with the Geek Squad? Yes. Now, looking at, before you look at Exhibit 20, do you recall that your mother scheduled the appointment for the TV to be fixed with this Geek Squad? I remember that I scheduled it, but it looks like she scheduled it and gave me the number to call in case I needed to reschedule it. And in fact, she emailed you on July 11th and told you if you can't keep the appointment on the 18th, call this number to reschedule it, right? Yes. You can put that aside.
I want to talk a little bit more about July 18th. Um, do you recall leaving your house that day on Aqua Ridge Ray around 12.30 in the I afternoon? Do. I do. And you were going to meet a friend for lunch at a place called Mosaic? Yes. But you had to pick up a body bottle of, I don't know if it's bourbon or whiskey. I don't even know if they're the same thing, but <laughs> bullet whiskey. It was um, bourbon. Okay. Um, it was for your friend's uh, wedding shower that night? They were having us stock the bar party, so they, um, they asked for specific kinds of alcohol to stock the bar. And... Um, showing you what's marked as Defense Exhibit 32. Is this the invitation that you received? Yes, that's it. Judge, I would move uh, Defense Exhibit 32 into evidence at this point in time. Here's State of mind. Do you recall on the right hand, left hand corner of the invitation, it says, help the bride and groom stock the bar for their wedding and bring a bottle of bullet bourbon? Do you, do you recall that? Yes. You can put that aside. Now, you decided to go to ABC Liquors on Bed and Road to look for the bourbon, right? I did. Okay. You're not a big drinker, is that fair to say? That is fair to say. You went to that store because you were familiar with it? I'd seen it close to my house, so. Close to your old house? Close to my old house. Okay. There could have been liquor stores that were closer to your current house? Sure. Now, when you drove to ABC Liquor, you tried to go through Trescott. Is that fair to say? It was blocked. There are other ways to go to ABC Liquor, right? You could have gone down other roads. I don't have the best sense of direction, so when I find a route, I just kind of keep using that route. I don't look for something else. You got to Mosaic at around 1 p.m.? That sounds right. And your lunch was in interrupted by investigator Isom who told you that something had happened? That's right. You went with him voluntarily to speak with him? You let police search your car? Yes. You were interviewed with uh, the investigator from two for approximately 2.45 p.m. until 7.50 p.m.? Yes. He told you that your ex-husband had been shot and was unlikely to survive, right? Yes. You were in shock? Yes. You were pretty open with police, telling them a lot of things, right? They kept telling me they needed my help, and so I kept trying to help. Now, you remember on direct, Ms. Kappelman asked you about this interview. Yes. And she asked you about all the people you mentioned during the interview, including Charlie. Yes. And you said I was just wheeling off names, right? Yes. In fact, isn't the first person in the interview that you mentioned was yourself? Yes. 
you said that you would understand if you were viewed as the prime suspect, right? Yes. Before you mentioned anyone else, you mentioned yourself. Yes. You told them about the motion to relocate. I did. You told them about the fight you had with Professor Markell that very morning about some swimming for the boys. Yes. You were spitting out a lot of ideas. I was. And you uh, agreed to let the police search your phone. Yes. You agreed to let the police search your car. Yes. That, that's where they found that picture that I wasn't able to admit of the invitation of the bull of bourbon, right? Yeah. You agreed to be fingerprinted. Yes. You agreed to be checked for gun, uh, gunshot residue. Yes. You gave them your computer to be searched. I did. Towards the end of your interview, you asked if you could, you asked the police officer if you could call your, your parents, right? I did. And the police allowed you to do that? Yes. And you called your mother's cell phone sometime around 7.04 p.m.? Yes. And you spoke to your mom, I don't know if you remember, but do you remember your dad being in the shower because they were going out to dinner? I don't remember. Your mom uh, didn't answer actually the first call and you, you called back a couple minutes later and she answered. Do you recall that? I don't. And when you called your mom, she was surprised? Yes. And you asked her to call Ch Charlie and tell him what happened, right? Yes. You didn't speak with Charlie that day, right? I don't think so. On July 19th, the next day, you spoke to Charlie at 10.50 in the morning. Is that, you won't know the exact time, but do you recall speaking with him in the morning? I honestly don't. Do you recall letting him know that Professor Markell had passed away in the early morning? I, I don't remember the conversation. When your parents, your parents came directly to Tallahassee, correct? They did. They stopped in Orlando and they got there on the, the morning of the 19th, right? Yes. And when they got there, they were scared and frantic, right? Yes. Your dad didn't sleep. He, he, he couldn't get police protection, so he planted his chair in the front of your window to make sure that no one was going to come to your house and shoot it up, right? Now you all attended a memorial service on the 20th, right? Yes. And you arranged for the Markells to see the boys after the memorial service, right? They all came over my house. And uh, you left Tallahassee, correct? Not on the 20th. No. On the 21st? Yes. And when you left Tallahassee on the 21st, did you bring all your belongings? I brought um, some swimsuits for the boys and some pajamas, and I thought we'd be back in a day or two. And when you left, you were not yourself? I was a mess. You got to South Florida and you realized that you could not take care of the boys alone at this point in time. I was, I hadn't slept in days and I was terrified. To get a little more specific, you wouldn't leave the house. No. And you would hardly eat. I wasn't eating, no. And ultimately, you decided not to come back to Tallahassee. I mean, I made that decision much later, but. And you had a friend who you grew up with, I think a, 
last name Keener, go back and get your more stuff at your house, right? He did. We have one more moment, Your Honor. Now, it's been said in this courtroom that you have tried to erase Professor Markell's memory from your boy's life. Is that true? It's not true. For the first two years after the murder, did you limit Professor Markell's family from seeing the boys? Absolutely not. In fact, they had complete access to the boys, right? 100%. They made dinners with the boys? I cooked dinner for them, yes, every time they visited. There were sleepovers and playdates? That's right. There was no animosity at all, right? No. And then in October of 2016, things changed, right? Yes. A letter was released where there was a suggestion that Professor Markell's mom was talking to the state about arranging custody for the boys in case you got arrested. Yes. And you saw that as a betrayal? Well, the custody was foster care, so yes. You saw that as her thinking that you killed her son? Yes. And as a result of that, rightly or wrongly, you decided to limit their access? I was afraid they were going to put my children in foster care. Do your children know anything about their father? They know a lot about their dad. Do they have a picture of him in their bedroom? Each boy has a picture of them and their dad over their bed that we say good morning to and good night to every day. Did you ben benefit from Professor Markell's death? No. Well, you got to live in South Florida. It's not a benefit. How are your boys doing? They're doing very well, thank you. How has your job prospects been since this case hit the news? Objection, relevance. Sustained. How are you doing? Objection, relevance. Sustained. Has this affected your life negatively or positively? Negatively. Does Charlie love his nephews? Very much. We have one moment, Your Honor. <coughs> Thank you, Ms. Adelson. I have no further questions. Redirect examination. <coughs> Thank you.
the long list of plans that you went over with Mr. Rashbaum that you were going to have in Tallahassee post murder date, none of those plans happened, right? No. Because you moved to South Florida, right? Because I felt unsafe to stay here, yes. And did you feel safe in South Florida? No. Did you buy a house in Tallahassee after the murder? No, I did not. Did you rent a house in Tallahassee after the murder? No, I didn't live in Tallahassee after the murder. Did the boys go to school that fall here in Tallahassee? No, all our plans were broken. And what was the purpose of those questions? Of course you didn't. You moved to South Florida. You didn't have plans in Tallahassee that got executed. Why, why were you asked about all those things? I, I don't know why I was asked questions by the defense counsel. <coughs> the book event that you were asked about, did that event happen? Uh, I didn't speak at the event, but the event still happened. Have you had several events re related to that book that have happened? I have. And what events were those? Um, do you mean just in Tallahassee or do you mean in other places? Everywhere. Um, I've spoken at various schools about human trafficking and about my book. Um, I think there was one event that still happened in Tallahassee about a year later. And was, is that the only book you've written or have you written more than one book? I've only written one book. What was the book about? The book was about human trafficking and about the vulnerabilities that lead to trafficking problems when it occurs and basically how to recover from it after. Where was the book set? It was set in a fictional town. What was the name of the fictional town? Hiawassee Springs. So Hiawassee. Is it located in the panhandle of Florida? No, I used to see the name when I was driving from Tallahassee to Orlando, so it's somewhere in between. And was the place modeled after Tallahassee? Hmm. It was definitely somewhere in Florida, but not supposed to be about Tallahassee, no. Who was the central character in that book? So there's three central characters. One was one of my clients, kind of a composite character from Eastern Europe. One was um, kind of a composite character of many clients I've represented from Latin America. And one was a public interest lawyer. And was the public interest lawyer Lily? Yes. And is that the character that was sort of based after yourself? No, really more based after a friend of mine. And was Hiawassee, Florida, quote, just a small stop on the way back to what we had previously known as civilization? Is that a quote from your book? That sounds like a quote from my book, yeah. And who's the husband of Lily, the public interest lawyer? You want his name in the book? Yes. I think it was Josh Stone. All right, and what was Josh's employment? Josh was an English professor. I'm sorry, what was your answer? Josh was an English professor. A professor, where did he teach? It's been a while, I wrote the book over 10 years ago. I don't remember what I named the university in the, <laughs> in North the story. North Florida State University? That sounds right. NFSU? NFSU, sounds right, yeah. All right, and in the book, does Lily lament, quote, we moved to this godforsaken place for Josh's career? Yes, that sounds like a line Lily would say. All right. When you looked at page 187 of the divorce document on Cross, and I'll hand that back to you. This is actually my copy. See the quote that you read previously from that page? I don't. Okay. It had to do with let's see if I can find it. That that you were very unhappy 
in the marriage. I think it's the third paragraph there. I see that line. Okay, the wife has been very unhappy in the marriage and files her petition for dissolution of marriage in August 2012. The husband continues to characterize this as abandonment and then it goes on to say that he had been disparaging you to some of the folks at the, at the law school. Do you remember reading that? I do. Was that intended to be the place in this binder where you allege emotional abuse by your husband? I mean, I, I think it's emotionally abusive to suggest somebody has mental health issues. Okay. What is the Prof's blog? You were asked about that on Cross. Yeah, it was, um, it was a blog that Danny started with some of his colleagues um, to kind of promote community in the law professor world. And who reads the plof, Prof's Probably Prof's other, blog? Probably other law professors and people interested in becoming law professors. Who is on the Crim Prof list serve? I don't know. Were Probably. you on the on the listserv for that prof's blog? I'm, I may have been on the listserv at some point. Do you remember seeing the post that you were shown on Cross? I do. Okay. And the post says something about Danny and I are planning to attend a conference that will begin Sunday, July 20th. Is there any other information on what you were shown about Dan's travel plans post-murder other than that? I'm sorry, can you please repeat the question? The post says, Danny and I, I guess it's another professor writing this thing, Danny and I are planning to attend a conference that will begin Sunday, July 20th. Is that the type of information that's, that he would typically have on something like the Prof's blog or Facebook? That sounds right. Okay, but as far as the date he's leaving, the flight he's on, that kind of stuff, would that typically be on the prof's blog? I don't, he wouldn't put what flight number he was on, but he would almost always communicate when he was going on a trip. Okay, so going to a conference that starts July 20th might be an example. Flying to New York tomorrow would be an example, okay. but, but not, he didn't not put, a flight number. But he didn't put flying to New York tomorrow in this, on this occasion? No. You were referenced several times, not on direct examination by the state, but by your brother's attorney on cross as a co-conspirator. Are you charged in this case? No. This isn't your trial, is it? No. Is your brother charged with conspiring with you to do a murder? No. Is he charged with conspiring with you to plan a murder? No. Is he charged with soliciting you to do a murder? No. Who is he charged with doing those things with? I don't think anyone. Have you had an opportunity to review his indictment in this case? I have not. Do you an opportunity to take a look at that document to yourself? Who is your brother alleged to have done these crimes with? Catherine D. Magbanawa. Were you on the wire in this case, Ms. Adelson? No. So when the bump happened, are you familiar with the event I'm referencing as the bump? I am now. When law enforcement approached your mother on the street and handed her a piece of paper? Yes. Okay, when that occurred, who did your mother call? I don't know. Not you, right? Not me. Okay. And once your brother found out about the bump, did he call you about it? No. Who did he call? I don't know. Well, you listened to the calls to authenticate the voices, didn't you? Just, just to hear the voices, not to hear the content of the calls. Okay. And the voices were your brother's voice, right? But I, I listened to the calls just to hear who was on them, so I don't know what content they're referencing. I heard your answer. My question to you now is your brother's voice was on the calls. He was on some of the calls I listened to. Okay. Your mother's voice was on the calls. She was on some of the calls I listened to. Did you have any secret meetings 
with your brother post bump that happened in South Florida? No. You were asked about Jeffrey Lacoste and the way that your relationship ended. What is OkCupid? Okay OkCupid okay is a dating website. Were you on that dating website? I was. Were you on that dating website at the time that you were dating Mr. Lacoste? No, I wasn't. And were you speaking, so I guess if you weren't on it, you weren't speaking to multiple men from the website during the time you were dating Mr. Lacoste. And I'll remind you that you provided your phone in this case and it was celebrated. Downloaded. That is denied as to improper impeachment is sustained. The jury is to disregard the last comment from the prosecutor. Go ahead. Didn't you just say that you weren't on OKCupid okay at the time that you were dating Jeffrey Lacoste? I don't know when we say I officially stopped dating Jeff Lacoste, but there's a chance that, I mean, I, I don't remember in 2014 whether I had gotten the app and started talking to people before we officially broke up. Okay, so my point is there's a chance that he was right. You were being unfaithful or at least talking to other people. He had a reason to be jealous. I think he had some serious jealousy issues that may or may not have been founded. Yeah, I think we got from your testimony that you believe he had serious jealousy issues. My question to you is, did he have a reason to be? No. So he was wrong. He was wrong in June when he accused me of being with multiple people that I wasn't with, yes. Okay. What was wrong with Dan's mother trying to make arrangements for the kids in the event of your arrest? Wasn't that a kind thing to do? I don't think it's kind to put my children in foster care. Wasn't the foster care intended only to cover the time frame that it would take for her to get on a plane and get here? She never said that. You thought she was just gonna leave them in foster care? I didn't know what to think. They have a mother, they don't need to be in foster care. But they wouldn't have a mother in the event of your arrest, Ms. Adelson. Wasn't that the intention of the email? I don't know what the intent of the email was. There's no, I was not going to be arrested for a crime I didn't commit. Was She didn't know that though, did she? I, I don't know what she knows or doesn't know. I can't speak does, to that. Does, do Dan's parents know whether you committed this crime or not? I don't know how to answer that question. How would they? Particularly back at the time that she sent that email. It was fresh at that time, right? I'm sorry, what was fresh? The, all the events that were occurring, the arrests. That was two years after Danny's murder. I don't know what she knew or didn't know. I know that my children don't belong in foster care. Was it a specific foster care that she was requesting be called in the event that the children had no place to go and were gonna be going into the custody of the state? She did suggest a specific foster care agency. A Jewish run foster care agency. A Jewish foster care. How many times have the kids visited Dan's parents since this murder? 
Many. It can be hard to count. Countless times? Countless times. How many times have they seen him in the last year? Um, we had a visit with Danny's dad and his, the boy's cousin this summer. We had, we've had a lot of Skype visits. They do live in Canada, so it makes mm -hmm. it a little bit harder to have in-person visitation. But every time they've asked for it, we've arranged it. Every time they've asked for an, a visit, you've arranged it? Yes, ma'am. How many times have they seen him in the last five years? Again. We Countless? Have, as in the last five years, that overlaps with the time when they tried to put them in foster care. So since we've established, since we've reestablished relations, we've seen them about twice a year whenever they come down to Florida. So in the last five years, they've seen them how many times? Two or three times a year? About that. Has this been a major issue between you and Dan Markell's parents, this issue of them having access to the kids? The issue of them trying to put them in foster care is a major issue, No, ma'am, that's yes. not my question. I'm sorry. Have, hasn't the issue of them trying to get access to your kids been a major issue, at least for them? Since they tried to put the children in foster care, yes. Before that, it was not a problem. Are you familiar with their work across the street at the legislature trying to get bills passed? Oh to give grandparents rights to see kids? I'm familiar with their grandparents legislation, but it's actually unconstitutional. Okay. Are you mad? Are you are you angry that according to your brother's theory, he and your mom have known who killed your children's father since 2014 and you weren't told who it was? I'm more angry that somebody killed my children's father. So you're not mad about that, that they knew this whole time? That's what they're saying. I'm sorry, can you repeat the That's question? the theory of the defense in this case, is that, they, that he's known the whole time. Your brother's known what happened to Dan. Does that make you angry? I'm angry about so many things, it's hard to is that one of them? separate them. Well, try. I'm confused. <laughs> hard to process and apparently according to his lawyer these killers had threatened to kill your brother's family members as well did you hear that I did hear that and that would be you right it was were you told that a specific threat had been made by the same people that had killed your ex-husband to kill your brother's family members I was not told would that have been information you would have liked to know back in 2014? Yes. Would you have made the same decision to move down to South Florida closer to the killers? No, I would not. And even after the killers were arrested in 2016, you weren't told that that's what was going on the whole time? I found out yesterday. No further questions. Members of the jury, you will be instructed to disregard the comment of the witness as to the constitutionality of any portion of the Florida statutes. You may step down. Will Ms. Adelson be recalled at any point? Look, 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 look into both of you. Will she be recalled at any point? Uh, that's possible, Judge. I'd ask that she remain under the rule, but she's free to go about her business. Have a good day, ma'am. Please call your next witness. Can I have a moment to see who's out there, Judge? Go ahead. Who is it? I don't know. <coughs> break. We'll take a 10 minute recess until 10:15.
Judge, are we still on the record? If there's something that you need to address, go ahead, yes. But um, before, not the next witness, I believe, but the next two witnesses, uh, we're just going to need to go sidebar at your leisure to discuss a couple issues. So just giving you a heads up. Let's go ahead and approach now while they're doing their break. Okay.
Everyone can be seated. Are the jurors ready? Bring them in. It went once potty is over. Everyone can be seated. State, please call your next witness. Please raise your right hand, sir. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give will be the truth? I do. You may take your seat. Please introduce yourself and spell your name. Officer Brannon, number 510, B-R-A-N-N-O-N, with Tallahassee Police Department. How long have you been with TPD? Uh, approaching 25 years, and I was with FSU PD for a couple years prior to that. Did you go to the scene in this case on July 18th, 2014? Yes, ma'am. What was your function there on Trescott Drive? Uh, I ended up writing the primary report. All right. What is what is the it's primary report? Just the initial report of the basics of you know what had occurred. Okay. And as part of your duties out there at the scene, did you maintain the crime scene, the integrity of the crime scene? Yes. How did you do that? Uh, we set up a perimeter, and once we established the perimeter around the crime scene, I was guarding the north end of it. What was the crime scene? Can you describe it for us? Uh, it was on Trescott Drive, and basically we blocked off the road, three or four houses to the north and to the south. Okay, so that whole area was considered the crime scene and only law enforcement was entering or exiting until you were done? Yes, ma'am. All right, when you arrived there, who was present on the scene from law enforcement or? Uh, Sergeant Sims was the first one on scene. Okay, was EMS then, there by the time you got there or did they arrive after you arrived? They were already there also. Okay, did you participate in clearing the residents there at Trescott? Yes. Was there any evidence of a struggle or a robbery present at the scene? Uh, in the garage. Okay, what was that? There was evidence of a robbery in the garage? Uh, of an incident, a violent incident. Compound question, I'm sorry. So there was some broken glass there. Yes, ma'am. Observed broken glass on the floor and inside of the vehicle. 
All right, was, but no evidence of anything that had entered into the home? No. Okay. As part of maintaining the crime scene perimeter, is crime scene tape put up across the road? Yes. And did you participate in doing that? I believe so, yes ma'am. And I think you said it was a, a couple houses down in each direction is where the tape was placed? Yes. And where were you phys physically positioned? I, my patrol car was blocking the roadway. All right, and were you on the, don't use north and south because that would be lost on me, were you closest on the side of the scene closest to Centerville Road or closest to the other side of Trescott? Uh, closer to Centerville. All right, I'm going to show you an aerial right. map that I've marked as States Exhibit 125. You recognize 125? Yes. Is that a fair and accurate map that includes the scene in this case? Yes, ma'am. Does it include the position that you were in at the crime scene tape? Yes. We've been somewhere right up in that area. Permission to publish 120, introduce and publish 125, Your So we can keep this moving, Mr. Rauschbaum, are you objecting to 125? Please approach. At this time, the defense has withdrawn any objection. You may continue with your examination. You may. So can you explain for the jury where the roadblock was that you were positioned out at the crime scene? So that blue dot right there is the victim's residence. I would have been somewhere right in that area. And can you show us in relation to that where Centerville intersects with Trescott? over here all right so if you were to turn on to Trescott from Centerville can you just kind of show us with your light 
the route of travel from Centerville to the roadblock? Comes around here, up, and back around. Okay. Would you have been able to see the roadblock from the intersection of Centerville and Trescott? No. If you had just started to turn on to Trescott and then rerouted back onto Centerville, would you have been able to see the roadblock that way? No, you'd have to go a considerable amount around. Okay. And from the roadblock where you were positioned, could you see the crime scene? Yes. And you mentioned that there was EMS and other law enforcement there. Were there law enforcement, marked law enforcement vehicles in the driveway and roadway directly in front of the crime scene? Uh, when I was on the perimeter position, mm -hmm. I know there was a lot of investigators and crime scene vehicles. I don't remember if any of the marked patrol cars were in front of the residents. They may have been. Okay, so what type of vehicles were out there? What act can you describe what sort of activity was happening at the Markell residence when you were at the perimeter? Basically the investigators and the crime scene techs taking care of their portion. And the crime scene tech vehicles are marked police and have lights on them and stuff. All right, so would it have been obvious to someone approaching your position in a vehicle that there was activity, law enforcement activity going on at that residence? It seems, it seems likely. Objection, Your Honor. Move the strike. Or the drums. Guessing. Stained as a speculation. You may continue. I'm going to approach and show you what's been introduced into evidence. I'll just publish 18. <coughs> Do you recognize this vehicle? Uh, it looks like a vehicle that I saw approaching the scene <laughs> that day. I'm sorry, will you repeat your answer? It appears to be a vehicle that I saw approaching the scene that day. All right, and this vehicle, are you familiar particularly with the make and model of this particular vehicle? Uh, yes, my wife drove a, two, well, we still have it. My daughter drives it now, 2006 Honda Odyssey. So at the time you had in your family the same type of vehicle? Yes. And did you know at the time that Wendy Adelson drove this type of vehicle? Yes. All right, so you noticed this vehicle or a vehicle identical to this one approach your position? Yes, ma'am. And what did the vehicle do when it approached your position? Uh, just stopped pretty quick and turned around and headed back in the other direction. Did the driver stop and inquire of you what the activity was at the Markell residence? No. Do you know what time of day that was that you observed this vehicle approach the, the roadblock? Uh, sometime a little afternoon, probably and around closer to one. And just to clarify, were there any <coughs> other roadblocks between where you were positioned and encountered this vehicle and the Centerville intersection? No. No further questions. Officer Brandon, good morning. Good morning. So um, I want to get a little bit more precise. Um, do you know how many? Do you know how many houses the tape was away from? Because we we just heard a couple. We heard maybe three. Do you know how many houses it was? I don't know exactly. I'm I'm approximating three or four houses. Do you, Do you know a forensic specialist, Maltese? I'm familiar. Uh, she testified that it was five to six houses away. Could that be correct? Could be. Okay. Um, 
You said that you um, saw the Honda Odyssey approach uh, in the afternoon, and you said it was closer to one. Do you recall testifying to that? I believe so, yes. Okay. Um, are you aware that cell phone data puts that car uh, on the outer perimeter later, meaning after 12.30 p.m.? I'm not familiar with any of that. But it would be consistent with your memory that it was closer to 1 o'clock, right? That appears to be, but it's been nine years. And when that car left, uh, you're aware that the ambulance was already gone, right? I believe so, yes. Okay. Could you see that the driver of the car was on the phone at the no. time that she approached? No. Okay. May I have one moment, Your Honor? No further questions, Your Honor. It's going to be redirected. Yeah, They have any yes, so when the minivan approached, there was there was crime scene tape and your law enforcement vehicle in the roadway. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. And beyond that, now I guess we're three to five houses down. No. How many? I, houses? Don't, I don't know. What's exactly. your best estimate? My best estimate was three or four. Okay, so three or four houses down from that tape is this law enforcement activity. Is that right? Correct. All right, and would the driver, however far away it was, have been able to see that law enforcement activity at that Objection. residence? Objection. Speculation. All allowed him to answer if he has a memory of you you were there, right? I was able to see it from my perspective. Okay, nothing further. You messed up now, Officer Brown. Will he be recalled by any party? No, sir. No, you're not. Please call your next witness. Have a good day. Jeffrey LaPasse. <coughs> Please raise your right hand, sir. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give will be the truth? Yes. You may take your seat. Please introduce yourself and spell your name. My name is Jeffrey Lacasse. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> J-E-F-F-R-E-Y-L-A-C-A-S-S-E. How are you employed, sir? I'm an associate professor at Florida State University. How long have you been with FSU? Um, I came back in 2013. I was also there from 2000 to 2008. Have you always lived in Tallahassee? No, I'm from California originally. I, I went to Phoenix for five years from 2008 to 2013. Really loved Tallahassee, so when I got a tenure track job here, I was excited to return in fall of 2013. Uh, did you have a relationship at some point with Wendy Adelson? I did. What was that relationship? We met in the fall of 2013. <clears throat> Apologize for my voice. I'm just getting a little water. You here. can have water. <clears throat> um, we started dating in the fall of 2013, September 2013. We dated casually in the fall and more seriously in the spring of 20, spring and summer of 2014. When did the relationship end? Well, that's a little tricky, but basically July of 2014. All right, we'll walk through that a little more yeah. in detail. During the time that you were dating Ms. Adelson, um, is that me? <laughs> I don't know, maybe we need to move it. 
Do I, is this about the right distance here? Can I'm not sure it's you, but I'm just Last time back it up a hair. I know, okay. it's hard to get right. Maybe speak up, we'll just help you. Yes, sir. All right. So during the time that you were together, did you become aware of Wendy Adelson's recent divorce from Dan Markell? I did. On our first several dates, that was the primary topic of conversation. And were you aware that this was an unusually nasty divorce? Yes. During the time that you were dating her, did you become aware that even subsequent to the divorce, there was ongoing litigation pending? Yes. Did you know Dan Markell? I met uh, Professor Markell. I did not know him. I probably spent 10, 15 minutes uh, in his presence across the course of that relationship. And were you specifically familiar with the litigation concerning Wendy Adelson relocating with her children to South Florida? Yes, that was a, a topic of conversation for sure. If you know, did Wendy want that relocation to take place? Yes. On our second date, the topic of relocation and being stuck in Tallahassee came up, and the date was ended abruptly when she went to the bathroom, returned with tears in her eyes, and just left the date because she was so upset. That was about two, two and a half months after it was denied. All right. And so it continued to be a topic, but that's... But that issue seemed to be specifically what was upsetting her on that day? Definitely. Well, she, she left a group date suddenly because it came up. All right. And did she have family in South Florida? Yes. And what family was that? Um, well, her brother, Charlie Adelson, um, Harvey Adelson, her father, and Donna Adelson, her mother, were the ones um, primarily that I heard about. Were you also familiar with the litigation seeking to limit the exposure of Wendy Adelson's young sons to her mom, Donna Adelson? Yes, in spring of 2014, yes. And. Did you observe Wendy to be taking that filing seriously? Did she seem stressed or worried about it? Every filing uh, she took seriously, and she was stressed. I had re reported to TPD that every time a motion was filed, it affected our relationship because she's very upset. During the time that you were in a relationship with Wendy, did you have an occasion to meet her family members in South Florida? I did. Well, I met her parents mostly up here. So I, I met Donna, Har Donna and Harvey Adelson probably eight to 12 times up here. I met uh, the defendant down in South Florida one time. All right, so you only met Charlie Adelson one time. That's correct. When was that? That was March, the evening of March 11th, 2014. And had you already met the parents several times at that point? Yes, probably six, eight times at that point, maybe more. So they came here quite frequently? Yes. What about Catherine Magbanawa? Did you meet her? She was present at the dinner that I attended on March 11th, where it was myself, the defendant, Wendy Adelson, and her went to dinner that evening, March 11th. You're saying the defendant. Do you see the person in the courtroom? Yes. That you had dinner with? Who's that? That is Charles Adelson, known to me as Charlie. Could you point him out and describe what he's wearing? Yeah, he's sitting in the center of the defense table wearing a light blue tie and a navy blue sports coat. All right. And so Catherine Magvanawa, how was she related to this family or affiliated with the family? I was introduced to her as Charlie's uh, new girlfriend, essentially. And was it your understanding that this was the first time that Wendy was meeting Catherine Magvanawa as well? That was my understanding. She was excited about, uh, about Catherine Magvanawa, and that was my impression, yes. All right, so anything unusual happen at the dinner? Well, at the dinner, uh, Ms. Magbanua mentioned that she had a, I guess it was her ex-common-law husband, um, who had a criminal history that sounded very serious, and I did raise my eyebrows at that. Did Charlie Adelson seem disturbed or upset by Catherine Magbanua mentioning that? I don't recall him seeming disturbed, no. All right, what about after dinner? Where did you go next? Uh, we went to Mr. Edelson's home, and we uh, sat in his hot tub and had a few drinks and talked for a little while. Who's the we that sat in the hot tub? Yeah, myself, Wendy Adelson. Uh, Charles Adelson was in the hot tub for a while, and uh, his then roommate, uh, Dr. Jerome Obed. All right, so Dr. Obed was living with Charlie Adelson at that time? That was my understanding. It was okay. his roommate, yeah. All right, and 
Where was Catherine Magbano at that time? She did not accompany us back to the house. In the hot tub, did the defendant make some statements that were of interest in this case? Yes. What were those? Judge, objection, motion in limine. I continue. Let me ask a more specific question. Did <coughs> Adelson in the hot tub mention anything about having connections to a criminal element? Yes, he did. He mentioned um, having contacts on both sides of the tracks, meaning dentists, lawyers, professional class people, but that he also had people he knew that were uh, a criminal element. Yes. Okay. And did he get more specific about what? Anything about these people that are the criminal element? He mentioned specifically, I repeated it to TPD, um, about Cuban neighborhoods where, where you might find that criminal element. Okay, so he had connections to those type of people. That's what he said, And yes. what was the context of this? Was he just seemed scared about it, worried about it, or something else? Seemed to be bragging. I want to ask you about a meeting with Wendy at a coffee shop that occurred on June 4th, 2014. Do you recall that? I do. Uh, what happened at the coffee shop? We went to the Red Eye Coffee Shop um, to, to have coffee just to meet midday, and Miss Adelson canceled a trip that we had planned um, for July 11th to 17th to go see my parents, which was a big deal in the relationship, and she abruptly canceled it. Um, Did she offer an explanation as to why she needed to cancel the trip? Not one that made sense. She said that she feared that we would not get back in time, and she had, she emphasized, had to be back on the 18th to pick the kids up out of school, which would have been July 18th, 5 p.m., is my understanding. And I couldn't fathom why in the summer going through Atlanta you wouldn't be able to get back in time. It didn't make any sense to me. So she was worried you could be delayed and she wouldn't be able to pick the kids up. Right, and I, we had people who could babysit. It didn't make any sense at all, but that was what she said. That day was very important. All right, and so that occurred on June 4th. It did. All right, did you see her later that evening? I did. I went to the house to hang out with her and her children. And is that her residence on Aqua Ridge? Yes, ma'am. And how was she that night? This is June 4th, right? It is. Okay. Um, she was uh, a nervous wreck to the point where she was sick to her stomach. Um, asked me to get to her house as soon as possible. She was in that much uh, distress. Um, and she didn't have food poisoning or flu or anything obvious. She was just a, a nervous wreck. So I went to, this, went to her house, immediately went to the store to get her Pepto-Bismol and couple things from the convenience store. I, I have the credit card receipt is why I recall that so specifically. And did you have any idea why she's acting? I assume this is unusual for her. It was fairly unusual. The, 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 the degree of severity was definitely unusual. Um, but that whole week, June 4th to 9th, she was very nervous. So. And she didn't didn't she, tell you it was because killers were in Tallahassee to kill Dan Markell, did she? No, I was stunned to later find out that there was hitmen in town at the time. Okay. 
So let's go forward a little bit to this TV situation. Do you know anything about Wendy's TV being broken? I do. And when was the TV broken, if you know? Between June 11th and 18th, I think it's closer to the 11th, but 100% in that week. And how do you know it was in that week? Because we rented a movie, How to Train a Dragon 2, to give the kids a special movie night. And I have text messages where I'm discussing having seen the movie by the 18th with friends. So you were able to refresh your memory? Yeah, I was able to refresh my memory. Yeah. Okay. All right, so do you get the movie? or? I, well, it was back in the day. It was Redbox, so I rented a DVD from a Redbox. It was 2014. All right, and go over there with the movie, and what happens when you arrive? I walk in the door, and uh, Ms. Adelson asks me to look at her television because there's something wrong with the television. And what was wrong with the television? Well, I turned it on, and I was immediately confused because it really shouldn't have been a question. As soon as you turn the TV on, it's been struck by an object and is damaged and basically unusable. Can you explain what the damage looked like? Yeah, it looked like somebody stood in front of it, took their fist, and hit it like that was my first impression. So uh, kind of like a shatter mark with spiders? Yeah, there's like an impact crater, yeah. and then there's, uh, up from that, there's, and it's all pixelated and distorted, which makes it very difficult, or really no one would watch this TV unless you, know, you had to. And I had second thoughts about that. I looked around the room, maybe the kids broke it, so I looked all around the room and I, it didn't seem plausible that the children broke it. They're very small. This object had to be kind of heavy. I'd thrown a ball around with them. I just couldn't see how the kids could have could have done it. But you uh, didn't see how it got busted. I didn't see it. I didn't know for sure. And I didn't know we'd be discussing this in a murder trial. So I didn't like investigate further or think about it very much, sure. to be honest with you. I just thought, OK. Were there other TVs in the house? There was a TV in the back bedroom, a similar make and model that we had watched television with the kids before on that TV before, so yes. Is that where you watched the movie that night? No, I went to go uh, hook up the DVD player in the back room. Miss Adelson insisted that it would not work and actually stopped me from even trying. So I um, thought that was very odd, but I didn't want to argue. And it's her house, her TV, her kids. So I said, okay. So did you watch the movie on the broken TV? Yeah, we, we gave the kids movie night where we watched a movie on a broken television that was distorted enough that you could follow what was happening, but the kids are whining and crying the whole time. And I wasn't whining or crying exactly, <laughs> but I was tempted to because it was, it was pretty frustrating. Um, and I just didn't understand, uh, you know, what was was going on. And of course, I had related that this TV is broken; it's unwatchable; it's not covered by warranty. You're gonna have to get a new TV. And I offered to go do that for her anytime she wanted. She's a busy single mom. I'll run by Best Buy, get you a new TV. It was not like a 80-inch TV or something that was really that luxurious. It was a TV like you'd see in a dorm room. So we could have replaced it right away. All right, did you end up getting a new TV? No, she turned me down several times on that offer, and I, again, it's her house, I tried to respect her boundaries, and I said, oh, okay. But it was inconvenient, because after dinner, you know, it's nice to be able to put the kids in front of that TV while you clean up the dishes and stuff, and okay. it sat there being an inconvenience for a while. All right. I want to ask you about, when, when is Ms. Adelson's birthday? April 22nd. Okay. Earth I've Day. This, I've got this out of order. Let's skip over that for now and go to the big fight in June. Um, Ms. Adelson mentioned that you, there was a big fight toward the end of June. Do you recall that? Yeah, that's the weekend of June 27th, 28th. Yeah. Where were you when that fight occurred? Um, we were in Gainesville. Miss Adelson accompanied me for a, uh, a work trip, and we had had that scheduled for a while, and we, we went, she accompanied me on a work trip, and we ended up having a pretty big argument Saturday night in the hotel. When did that have to do with you accusing her of seeing other men? That was one of the issues. There had been a lot of tension bubbling. That was the major issue. But just to give that some context, I suspected very strongly she was seeing other men. Um, of course, uh, your office had confirmed recently to me that there was multiple online active um, 
dating accounts the whole time we were supposed to be exclusive. Um, but just to give context to that, that was combined with Wendy promising me the world in June. Um, talking about me moving in, shouldn't get a Jeep, you should get a car that car, you know, the, the, the kids' car seats will fit in. The kids should start calling you daddy was the most outrageous one. that I, I, And so she's like throwing herself at me over the top in a way that felt totally disingenuous and fake. And at the same time, I think she's seen other guys. So it just kind of, it just kind of boiled over. I tried to have like a serious, honest relationship conversation with her, and that didn't go very well. So you were kind of, at least up until all of this started happening, you were kind of full steam ahead, and it seems like she was a little stop and go, hot and cold. Is that? It was accurate? a roller coaster, is okay. what I would say. And I, I had felt since April that I was perhaps being strung along. I had that intuition. I didn't couldn't fathom a reason why you would string a string a guy along like that. It didn't make any sense at the time. All right, so June, we're in June, like, 28th range? Okay. Okay, when when do you come back from Gainesville? Um, the morning of the 29th, after this, <laughs> this fight or this argument, uh, we drive back. We drive back to, to Tallahassee. You know, I had another ride back, and I offered to, to take that other ride if the fight was that bad, you know, because we could have broken up after this. That was... Um, but but she did. wanted to ride back with me. You so. rode together. Yeah, we rode together. All right, so you rode back together, and then was she leaving that day? I believe, I believe it was the, mm, I thought she picked up the kids the next day from Professor Markell's house, and that's when she met Amy Adler, and that was a big deal to her. Amy Adler was... Dan's girlfriend at the time? Yes. Okay, um, so it's at some point after the big fight and the return from Gainesville, does she leave to go to South Florida? Yeah, yeah. I never, I, uh, a day or two later, she definitely leaves to return to South Florida. She's in South Florida by July 1. All right, and was that the trip that she was there for her dad's birthday? That's correct. Did you attend the dad's birthday? No, I, I was never invited to the dad's birthday. All right, and were you aware what the big gift was for Dad's birthday? No. All right, so when did you see Wendy next after she leaves to go to South Florida? Or yeah. I guess after you return from Gainesville. So during that two-week period, we're exchanging emails, texts, long phone calls, video chats with the kids. Things are up and down, but it seemed like it's probably going to be okay. That's the impression I was given by Miss Adelson. Or I was being strung along two more weeks, um, but I see her again on the 13th when she come back, comes back in town and is excited to have a date with me. So we had a date. All right, so now we're at July 13th, 2014. That's correct. So within a week of the murder. That's right. Okay, tell us about your interactions with her that day. Yeah, we went to dinner and a movie, and we returned to our house on Aqua Ridge. All right, and did she tell you anything in com asked to tell you anything in confidence that evening yeah in a very serious tone of voice the topic of conversation as we're walking up to the house is about relocation being stuck in Tallahassee and Danny as the conversation always was about Danny Markell um, she said in a very serious tone of voice can I tell you something in confidence Objection, Your Honor. motion to I think I do judge, but ask to approach. Please approach.
bailiff is going to escort you out. Mr. Lacoste, you can step down from the witness stand for now. Okay. Please step back outside. Everyone can be seated. Bringing up both the motion in limine and the prior order that have been issued on this matter. The ruling that was made as to the defense motion in limine concerned the state eliciting this as a part of its case in chief. However, Mr. Roush Baum, at this point, Ms. Adelson has specifically denied making this statement. Why is this not an, why is this an improper ground for the state to explore this on impeachment? It's still hearsay, Your Honor. It's double hearsay. It, it's not done to All sorts of matters that otherwise would be inadmissible can become impeachment. Judge, they, if, if, if Dr. Adelson, Charlie Adelson, made that statement to Mr. Lacoste and he denied it, he could impeach him. They're impeaching another witness. That's not allowed. That's number one. Number two, I brought up the this impeachment issue. of one witness's testimony through another is not allowed. But they're impeaching her to go to his statement. They're stuck with her answer. They could have kept on cross examining her of why they thought her answer was wrong. They can't now backdoor it through hearsay in another witness. That was the whole point of the motion. Similarly, Judge, we brought this issue up. First thing this morning, sidebar, because if they were going to be allowed to do it, I was going to ask Mr. Ms. Adelson other questions on this issue. They said they weren't going to do it. So I didn't ask her those questions. And I didn't ask her those questions because I didn't want to open the door to it. And I can't call Ms. Adelson back as a witness because she has a Fifth Amendment right and I can't give her immunity. I brought this up for this very reason. She denied the statement yesterday. That's why I brought it up today. They can't backdoor a double hearsay statement based on a denial by that witness. Can't do it. Ms. Kappelman. But it's not hearsay. It's offered for impeachment. Ms. Adelson was specifically drawn to the time and place of this statement and asked if she made it. She denied it. Make 
This is not an insignificant fact or an immaterial one. Mr. Rauschbaum, if you wish to find some authority, I will give you five minutes to look if you have anything to argue as to this matter. Ms. Adelson has denied making the statement. She can be impeached through other witnesses regarding this matter. Judge. I will give you an opportunity to find some authority. If there's something more specific you can point me to other than what you're arguing right now. Judge, I brought this up this morning so that I could front it with Ms. Adelson. And we were told, you were told, that they weren't going down this path. If I'd been told something different, I would have done something different that I can no longer do. It's precisely why I went sidebar first thing in the morning. What is your response as to that portion of the argument, Ms. Kappelman? I don't know that that's a legal argument. I was asked if I was intending to offer double hearsay. I said I would never be offering hearsay without an exception. This I assume he's making this on fairness grounds, which goes to this would have changed his strategy of how he examined the witness. I don't know what to do about that, Judge. I can't help Mr. Rashbaum have better strategy. I was real specific with the witness to get that denial, so I'm not sure why the issue wasn't raised at that point. Judge, I was really specific this, moment, this morning that the double hearsay related to my motion to eliminate related to Jeffrey Lacoste. You knew what I was talking hold, about. Hold on. My ears work perfectly well. You don't have to raise your voice. Make your argument, please. Everyone sidebar knew exactly what I was talking about. And we were told, Ms. Kappelman told you as an officer of the court that she was not going down that road. And so when Ms. Adelson was on the stand, I stayed away from it, not to open the door to it. She knew exactly what statement we were talking about. If you tell me you didn't know what statement I was talking about, I'll sit down. I was very specific. I was very specific that it was the double hearsay statement related to Jeffrey Lacoste that we filed our motion in limine on. I was very specific that it applied to this and also the Juvia dinner. Those were the words specifically out of my mouth back there because when she asked the questions of Ms. Adelson, which were completely appropriate, I thought she might be going down this path. And so the first thing in the morning, we went sidebar so I could stop the charade so that if the court were going to allow it to come in, I would handle it. She stayed silent. And I've been jumping up and down to try to prevent any possible mistrial twice and and still no mention of it. It's completely unfair, completely improper, and it denies him his constitutional right of due process. Again, that's why I raised the issue. This goes to the fairness aspect of it. We'll take a brief five minute recess. If you have any authority you wish to present, I will entertain it further.
Everyone can be seated. Unless either party has additional argument, I am prepared to rule at this point. I did have one thing I wanted to raise that I'm not sure was here before. Ms. Adelson is still under the state subpoena, so I think she could be brought back for whatever additional questions need to be asked. As to that point, Ms. Kappelman, the ability to extend immunity, you have Mr. Rauschbaum does not. He calls her as a part of her, excuse me, as a part of the defendant's case. What is your response to that? I don't know. I mean, we're still in the state's case, so. Well, the defense can't call a witness within the state's case. I know. That's a good point. I just wanted to point out that she is still under my subpoena, so if the state created it, that might be a solution. I don't know. It hasn't been proffered what questions would be asked that weren't asked. I don't know what that is, but maybe there's something that could be worked out if that was your Honor's ruling, was that that would be required. Mr. Rauschbaum, anything else? Judge, I'll just rest on 9609 Florida rule and its progeny and Crawford and its progeny and what I said before. Very well. The court's ruling is as follows. The defense's motion in limine went to the state's ability as a part of its case in chief to present testimony from Mr. Lacoste that would be hearsay within hearsay. The motion in limine was granted on those grounds. However, the motion in limine and also the court's ruling did not discuss or limit in any way the state's ability to present this information as impeachment. Ms. Adelson, at this point, she has testified. She has denied the statement taking place whatsoever. However, as it goes to fundamental fairness grounds, which are also a part of the ruling that has to be made, the defense did earlier at sidebar ask if this was going to come up in some way. As it related to substantive evidence, I believe the state responded it was not. The state did not make any representations concerning impeachment. I will find that this did affect the defense's ability or their strategy, at least in examining the witness. As the witness also can invoke her Fifth Amendment right and through a separate pleading has stated through counsel that she will invoke any Fifth Amendment right unless she is being granted immunity for that testimony. The ability of the defense to address this matter is compounded by the constitutional right of the witness and their inability to call her. On fundamental fairness grounds, I'm not going to permit the impeachment on this topic. You may proffer the testimony from there. If the state is intending to recall the witness at that point, the issue of impeachment may be revisited. Does everyone understand? Yes, may I make one clarification for the record? Go ahead. It's already on the record. We were at sidebar. What I was asked, my understanding of what I was asked is was I intending to introduce any hearsay within hearsay through Mr. Lacoste? And my answer was that I would not introduce any hearsay within hearsay without exceptions. I think it was clear what I was intending to do was set up an impeachment through Ms. Adelson by drawing her attention to the specific date and time of the statement and asking her specifically if she made the statement, which she denied. I find it hard to believe that that doesn't alert the defense in fairness that that's what I'm intending to do. And that's what I did in the last trial successfully, which the defense in this case was in attendance at. So I think it's unfair to the state. But I understand your honor's ruling and we'll be ready to proceed. Please bring in the witness so we can go through the proffer. Our words are stock and trade. If you are uncertain, Ms. Kappelman, as to what Mr. Rauschbaum was raising, we probably should have clarified it at that point. Please bring in the witness.
also, so we don't have to go through this again, Mr. Rauschbaum, as it pertains to the other rulings in the defense's motion in limine that the court has previously addressed. Although they may not be certain rulings pertain to the state's ability to present as substantive evidence. You understand this does not affect their ability to present it as impeachment as it pertains to all of the items that have been ruled on previously. June and Chimda, meaning everything that we've been previously addressing through these motions. Well, they, they still have to follow the extrinsic evidence rule, the collateral evidence rule. My point being, something that cannot come in substantively can still be impeached with. You understand this? Can? Yes. I'm not it's saying it's necessarily going to happen. Right. But so we're not doing this song and dance about any other matters. All right. If we need to have sidebars and you're attempting to clarify something, if you're asking specifically as to impeachment, you need to be specific as well. Fair enough, Your Honor. Ms. Dugan, please bring in Mr. Lacoste. You may be seated, Mr. Lacoste. Ms. Kaplan, you may finish your sequence of questions on the topic you were starting. Mr. Lacoste, when we broke, we were discussing a statement made to you by Wendy Adelson on July 13th, 2014, at her residence here in Tallahassee. Do you recall which statement? Yes, ma'am. All right, and what was that statement? After asking to speak to me confidentially, she told me that last summer, that Charles Adelson had looked into all possible options to take care of the Danny Markell problem, including hiring a hitman, and that it would cost about $15,000. I revised the amount. I said potentially that could have been $50,000. I'm unsure of the amount. The rest of the statement, very confident it's true. So you weren't sure whether she said 15 or 50. Right. But she didn't say 15 or 50. She said one or the She's, other. I, she said one number that I thought was 15 when I talked to TPD and later thought that could have been 50. Okay, I'm with you. And this statement was made in what context? What was her demeanor? Um, well, she asked to speak to me confidentially. She's, she was dead serious about it. It was a chilling statement. I had a reaction to it. My stomach flipped, a little scary, a little weird. So it was a very serious statement she's making. So clearly not a joke. No, it was not a joke. There are other jokes in that domain. This was completely distinct and discreet from any joke. This was not funny. And this statement was made within five days of Mr. Markell's murder by a hitman? That's correct. And was this said in any way in context in the context of the relocation issue well the what preceded her saying that was a discussion of um which under what circumstances could she or would she leave tallahassee and she stated that the only way to leave tallahassee was if something happened to danny that's what led into the statement i just repeated right. to you thank you that's the proffer your honor in a cross-examination <laughs> concerning the subject of the property Sorry, I'm Any cross examination as to the subject of the proffer? Yes, Your Honor. Go ahead. <coughs> the statement was chilling and serious, right? Yes. Did you go to the police? I did not. You were so scared about the statement that you didn't alert the police the next day, that night. I, I did not. Why not? Because it was a past tense statement, and I thought Charlie was a scary guy, but it was about something supposedly he did last summer. Not, I did not know there was a present case, a present instant uh, threat. I did not know him and visited Tallahassee. I didn't have the context. So the statement comes out, and you say, all right, now I could call the police. Hey, Wendy, you want to go out tomorrow? 
That's not quite how it went. No, you didn't try to go on a date with her the next day? No, we did go on a date the next day, and then she cut off all contact without barely talking to me on that date. So I didn't have a lot of time to process it, but uh, it was a shocking enough thing that it took a day or, or two to process. Also, I had uh, repeated that statement uh, to a friend of mine before the murder, and I didn't get a reaction from her like, this is shocking, I sought feedback from a friend. Um, who would verify that I made that statement before the murder, and she said, she didn't say, oh geez, you should call the police. So uh, it wasn't just me. Um, there was another person that I consulted with because it freaked me out, and we decided it was, well, I decided after talking to her, it was past tense, so probably not that dangerous, and we were really wrong. And maybe I should have called the police. So Charlie Adelson lets you know that he's uh, has friends in the criminal element, the Cuban criminal element, right? Yes. And you know that there is a heated dispute between this family. You testified to it today. A heated dispute. Yes. About relocation, about divorce. Well, the dispute's no longer about relocation. Uh, but, yes, there's an ongoing lit litigation for sure. Right. And uh, then I, it, Wendy Adelson tells you that this man, who is part of the criminal element, really looked into hiring a hitman. She did say that. And you thought... I'm not going to go to the police on that. That's your testimony, right? That's the decision I made. It didn't really cross my mind because of the past tense nature of it. And I consulted with a friend, bounced it off of her before the murder. And uh, neither one of us thought, oh, geez, let's call the police. So it's possible that probably is so dangerous that I should have called the police. Yeah, but I okay. did not. And, and so at this point in time, your relationship with Wendy Eelson was really bad, right? It was hard to tell. It hard to hard. tell that it was really bad? It was a roller coaster ride constantly because you referred to the next night, uh, the next day, the 14th. On the 14th, I got a warm inviting call from Wendy Adelson, eager to spend time with me. Maybe trying to distract me, I don't know. But, okay. uh, well, we're going to get to the distracting part. Yeah. Uh, because that's what this is all about. But it wasn't in a great, the relationship was not in a great spot. I'll concede that to you. So yes. your testimony is that when this woman is about to break up with you, when she is avoiding you, when you have uh, just been caught going through her phone and her how she How is she avoiding me? Well, Mr. LaCoste, you're not here to ask questions. Yes, sir. You. Your testimony is that when you are on the outs with her, which the record will show you were during this time period, that she confides in you the most serious, the most important thing in her life. That's your testimony, yes or no? Yes. Okay. Um, she has a history of boarding out things that aren't in her own self-interest. Judge, I would ask that to be stricken from the record. It's unresponsive. This is just a part of the proffer. And if you've reached the end of your cross-examination on the proffer session, we do need to move on. That's fine, Your Honor. Mr. Lacoste, or actually Ms. Kaplan, the court's ruling remains the same. You're not to inquire further as to this subject matter. We will revisit later if it comes to it. Yes, sir. Please bring back in the witnesses, or the, excuse me, the jurors. <coughs> There is the celebration dinner. I'm sure that's the next one. So is it the same ruling in reference to the celebration dinner? Well, one moment because I don't know what the celebration dinner is all about. It's in the same motion in limine, Judge. Bring it back up. Number two. I believe this just concerns statements. It doesn't say anything about solving. All rise, jury, enter the courtroom. One, one, one moment. <laughs> Where is the celebration dinner covered in your motion? It's in the same motion in limine regarding the hearsay statements. There were several of them. The first one was the statement that we just discussed, and the second one is that Charlie Adelson said that he went to uh, dinner with it, that she told. Uh, that she told him that Charlie Edelson said it was a celebration dinner. It's in the same motion in limine. Oh, however, this statement is being directly attributed to your client, 
that was heard by the witness. No. Mr. Lacoste, please step down again. It's the same exact issue. It's Wendy Edelson telling him what Charlie Edelson said. Cavalman responds. Yes, sir. I asked Ms. Adelson about the dinner. She acknowledged there was a dinner. She did vomit at the dinner table, um, but denied calling it a celebration dinner or hearing Charlie Adelson call it a celebration dinner. I anticipate this witness would indicate that it was referred to as a celebration dinner. Um, it's the same issue, and you ruled, you ruled on this issue. It's the same motion in limine. I have. I'm looking at the line now. All right, Ms. Kappelman, I believe we find ourselves in the same position unless you have an argument which differ differentiates the television from the celebration dinner. I think I understand what you mean, Judge. I don't have any additional argument other than this is offered for impeachment. It's not hearsay, not covered by the motion. The appropriate grounds were laid and it's admissible as impeachment. Do you wish to proffer the celebration dinner by Mr. Lacoste as well? No, sir. I think my preference at this point, assuming your ruling will be the same on the celebration dinner, is to have Mr. Lacoste step off the stand, proceed with another witness, and revisit this issue after the lunch break. Very well. Please bring the jurors back in. You may end your examination in front of them, and then Mr. Rauschbaum will have his opportunity. Well, actually, Mr. Rauschbaum, how long do you believe your cross-examination of the witness will take? I'm a little In confused. front of the jurors. I'm a little confused. Are you the, the ruling is the impeachment as the celebration dinner is going to be excluded on the same grounds for now. If we need to revisit later, we will. But as to your cross-examination, that will be taking place in front of the jurors on the subject matter that's already been covered. How long do you think that's going to take? Oh, she's going to stop asking questions of this witness. I believe she just indicated she would. Okay. Um, uh, for the issues that we've dealt with just now. Uh, Prior to any proffers and sending the jurors yeah, out. Um, I'm not really sure, Your Honor. Probably uh, maybe 30 minutes. All right, let's bring them back in. You can start your cross. We'll take the lunch break and then pick up from there. Back in the witness. All right, they're entering the courtroom. Everyone can be seated. Bailiff, if you can please instruct Mr. Lacoste to come back in. State have any further direct examination for this witness? No further questions at this time, Your Honor. You may cross examine. Thank you, Your Honor.
Professor Lacoste, good morning. Good morning. You met Charlie Edelson one time, right? That's correct. It was a trip that you and Wendy took down to South Florida for a day after a spring break with the, with the kids that she taught. Yeah, we were in Immokalee, and then we went over to Miami, or to Fort Lauderdale and Miami, just for the 11th, that's right. And uh, you had dinner, you said on, you had dinner on March 11th of 2014 at a place called Yardbird? That's correct. You recall Charlie was in his scrubs? Don't recall that, but it wouldn't surprise me. Um, and Catherine McBanawa was at that dinner, right? She was. And I think you said that she was bringing up stuff about her ex, right? Not a lot, just a little bit, but she did bring that up, and I recalled it. Is it fair to say that she was pushing for information at that dinner? From whom? From Miss Adelson. I don't recall that. Well, was she trying to get Miss Adelson to talk about her ex-husband? I don't recall that. Do you recall there being a lot of discussion at the dinner about Professor Markell? Don't recall a lot. It always came up for a minute. It came up in the context of Wendy Adelson's book. Um, most of it was Charlie talking. You recall Katie asking questions about how the divorce was going, how he was treating her, where he was. You, re you don't recall any of that happening at the dinner? I do not recall any of that. The only thing you recall is her saying something about her ex-husband. That's what stuck out. We've had previous legal proceedings where I also could not, I mean, I, I can't, it's a dinner nine years ago. I don't remember a lot of detail of it. And it, was very, it wasn't long either, it was just an hour. Isn't it likely that she was talking about her ex-husband and her problems because there was talk about exes? I mean, that's pure speculation on my part. I don't recall. I, I do recall some other things we spoke about, but I, I don't know if I'm allowed to talk about them or not. Um, they involve your client. They weren't. Um, so I'm in my head trying to figure out how much space was there for other stuff. Um, as I previously testified, most of it was Charlie telling us stories, kind of. But Katie was clearly wanting to bring up the topic, as you said, about her family situation, correct? Yeah, but I'm talking about two or three sentences here. I only recalled that in retrospect because there was a murder, and I thought, oh, geez. And it was important enough for you to, for Ms. Kappelman to ask you about that, right? Okay, yeah. Right? So you remember her talking about her family situation. Right? Yeah, and I also remember Charlie talking about a party he had recently attended. There's a few other random things. Fair enough. I didn't, yeah. I didn't ask, with all due respect, I didn't ask you that. Okay. <laughs> Let's just stick with the family situation. Okay. So Catherine McBanawa was talking about her family situation, correct? For two or three sentences, she mentioned that Fredo Garcia, not by name, um, and the tensions with him, yes. Okay. You see that uh, Charlie talked in the hot tub or the pool about having connections to the criminal element. That's what your testimony was, right? Yes, starting with my initial statement to TPD, yes, sir. And you're talking about your statement to TPD after the murder, right? Three days after the murder. And after you thought Wendy Adelson was trying to frame you for the murder, right? I didn't think that in that interview. Okay. It took me some time to process. Uh, you were aware that you were called in as a suspect for the murder, right? Yes. Okay. And after that point in time is when you gave that statement to TPD regarding what Mr. Adelson said. Just yes or no? After I was called into the police station? Yes. Yeah, that's when I, I gave my statement at the police station. Right. What, what I'm making clear is it's not like you had uh, dinner and were in a hot tub with Charlie Adelson and you went back to Tallahassee and gave the statement then. Right? No, I would have no reason to do that. I understand that, Professor Lacoste. I'm just trying to make it clear yeah. for the jury when you gave TPD the statement. Yeah. And the answer is you gave him the statement after the murder and after you were called in as a suspect on that murder. That's correct. Okay. Now, do you recall um, texting Charlie Adelson after you met with him? I texted Mr. Adelson one time, yes. 
Okay. And do you recall saying to him, Hey, Charlie, it's Jeff, as in Wendy and Jeff. Hey, man, thanks for your hospitality the other night. Sorry about the clusterfuck with the cab. It was great to finally meet you. I can tell how proud you are of your sister. I am too. She's really one in a million. Take care, dude, and look forward to seeing you again sometime soon. Do you recall texting him that? I do recall texting him that. Okay. You like hanging out with the criminal element? It was my new girlfriend's brother who she was very close with. I've been dating Wendy t uh, seriously for 12 days. I didn't think it was right to give a... I was polite rather than honest, let's put it that way. I mean... Let me ask the question again. Yeah. Do you like hanging out with the criminal element? Uh, no, I don't okay. do that. Did Charlie Adelson text you or did you text him? I texted him. I can't remember if that was solicited by Wendy Adelson or not, but I texted him. It wasn't solicited by Charlie Adelson, right? No, we never spoke again, though. Okay. Actually, he texted you back. Right, I never answered. And he said, it. it was great seeing you. I'm glad you made your flight. Hopefully, we can all hang out soon. Mm -hmm. Now... You testified that Wendy was a wreck. Hold on one second, sorry. One moment, Your Honor. I've lost my place. Um. You testified about uh, some of these divorce filings uh, on direct, correct? Yes. And um, that Wendy, you testified that Wendy was a wreck about him, right? Yes. Okay. That's not what you thought in the spring of 2014, though, was it? You're questioning whether it is what I thought is spring of 2014, I noticed repeatedly her reacting to motions and litigation and getting very, very upset. I'm not saying there was never any good times, but she was very upset when he filed something. Do you recall sending an email to Wendy Adelson in March 27th of 2014 where you tell her that she's adapting, adapting really well to unpleasant circumstances and that she needs to give herself more credit? That sounds familiar. I would say it got increasingly worse March, April, May, June in terms of reactions to uh, the entire situation. But I, 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 I was sending that email, yes, trying to encourage my girlfriend at the time, yes. Oh, really, it got, it got worse. Filings in March, April, and June. No, I, I don't know when the last filing was. Her, her reactions, not just to filings, but the entire situation, let me clarify that. Uh, so. uh, hold on a second. Would it surprise you that there weren't any filings? No, I'm in May or June? No, I'm aware of that. I'm Would it surprise that. you that there's been testimony in this courtroom that actually things got a little better? Wendy's status didn't get better. My observations of Wendy saw her uh, spiraling downward in that time period is what I was trying to refer to. Do there. you recall that in the spring, summer of 2014, Professor Markell asked Wendy's parents to babysit for him? I didn't know about that, or I don't recall it if I did. I'm sure you did. Now, do you recall telling law enforcement that your impression was that Professor Markell's mm -hmm. filing was going to fail? Yes, I was rep 
repeating things I'd heard from Wendy Adelson. So most of that content that was, I mean. Sir, I'm just asking you for yes or no questions. Okay. Uh, let me follow up of where you get that information from. Okay, okay. I, I know you have an yes, agenda. I, yes, I told, yes, I told police that, yes. Okay. So you told the police that Wendy wasn't concerned about Professor Markell succeeding no. with that motion. No, she was highly anxious. She was highly anxious. Did she think that the motion was going to be granted? I don't think she knew. I think that's what caused the anxiety. Didn't you tell law enforcement that your impression was that Professor Markell's motion was going to fail? I did tell law enforcement that, yes. And didn't you just tell the jury that that impression came from Wendy Adelson? Well, from my interactions with her and partially my own opinion, to, to clarify. But uh, yes, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. You also told law enforcement that everyone in the legal community agreed with that assessment. I didn't speak to everyone in the legal community. Well, let's read your interview then. And let's see if it refreshes your recollection. One moment, Your Honor. You don't call, recall being recorded where you said, and I quote, everyone in the legal community agreed with that assessment at two o'clock on 723.14 interview part one at 34.35 in the interview. You don't recall saying that? Can you give me the date in the interview again, please? 723.2014, interview part one, and 3-6-2015, you reiterated it at 34 minutes and 35 seconds into the recording. You don't recall saying that? Vaguely, I do recall saying something like that. I'm a non-lawyer trying to figure out this situation. Getting different messages from different people. I have no further questions right now, Your Honor. At the time you were in the hot tub with the defendant, did you know that he was a criminal element? I, I mean, okay, let me rephrase yeah. it. Did you know he was conspiring to commit the murder of Dan Markell? I had no idea. All right, and when you were at dinner with he and Catherine Magbanawa, did you know that she was conspiring to commit the murder of Dan Markell? I had no idea. So you didn't know when you were in the hot tub that you were hanging out with a criminal element in that regard? No. Nothing further. Because you step down, you maybe recall at some point. Members of the jury, we're going to take our lunch break at this point. Once again, I'm going to remind you not to discuss the case with each other or anyone else. Do not look at any news coverage or discuss the matter with any friends or family. Enjoy your lunch break. We will get started once again at 1.15. Please report back by 1.10. I hate to ask because I'm almost afraid what will come back. Do the lawyers have anything to raise before we go on lunch break? I don't know who the witnesses are, <laughs> but we'll find out. What's that? I have a vote with defense counsel. Go ahead.
Sorry, Your Honor, just one second. Um. Wonderful answer. Uh, next time we have a proffer, Mr. Rauschenbaum, if you can keep your voice down for the information that you don't want the jurors to hear, it's that wall still <laughs> something can get through. Keep the volume down. Thank please. you, Your Honor, for the reminder. It's a bad habit. All right. Please be back by 110 as well. We'll get started then.
Everyone can be seated. Second scariest question I'm going to ask today. Do the parties have anything to raise before the jurors come in? <laughs> Ms. Capleton. No, sir. Mr. Rauschbaum. No, Your Honor. Please bring in the jurors. While the testimony is taking place of a witness, you'll need to remain outside until that witness has finished with testimony. Everyone can be seated. Members of the jury, I hope you had a restful break. We are going to resume with the state's case at this time. Please call your next witness. They call Stephen Webster. You can your break. Please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give will be the truth? Yes, sir, I do. You may take your seat. Thank you, Judge. Please introduce yourself and spell your name. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Stephen Webster, uh, S-T-E-P-H-E-N-W-E-B-S-T-E-R. How are you employed? I'm an attorney. How long have you been a member of the Florida Bar? Since 2005. Did you represent Dan Markell? I did. During what time period did you represent him? I think it was May of 2014 and until he was murdered. And during the time that you were, well, let me ask you, before his murder, when was the last time you had spoken with him? I spoke to him that morning. Right. And what was the main goal of your representation of Mr. Markell? So I, I had just started my firm and you know, like any small business, you're scared and you're hungry. And uh, a friend of mine called me, Tor Friedman, and said, I have a client for you. And I was like, okay. And he said, he's a law professor. And I was like, okay. And uh, he said, it's a family law case. And I said, well, Tor, I don't do family law and you know that. And he said, well, it doesn't matter. He's a law professor. He'll teach you everything you need to know. And I said, okay, well, that makes sense. So I, um, I agreed to meet with him. And the night before I read all the papers, and they were voluminous. I printed them and actually read every word. <clears throat> and I'd, we'd already set up a meeting at Voodoo Coffee, 
on Tennessee Street. And I really didn't think I was going to accept the case. Um, I could just tell from the, the tenor of the papers that it was really, really contentious. And um, it just didn't feel like something I probably wanted to get involved in. And, but I wanted to meet him anyway. And so I met him, and I liked him. I liked him a lot. And so I decided I would take the case. I mean, I, it's not a prerequisite that I like you to represent you. Um, but in something like that, I didn't want to get involved in a contempt type case with law professors um, where ultimately it could end up being disrespectful to the court. And I didn't want to be involved in something like that if, it was, if I really felt like it was going to be that kind of a relationship. But when I met him, I didn't feel like it was going to be that way. And so I agreed to take it. And his primary concerns were he wanted to get more time with his children, if at all possible. But he didn't want to change the kind of the time sharing. He had a kind of an unusual request. Um, he wanted to see if there was any way that he could see the children every night when he didn't have them to tuck them into bed and kiss them goodnight. And he said, look, I'll only stay five minutes. I promise I won't bother anybody and I'll leave. And I said, Dan, that's probably never going to happen. That's just probably not reasonable. Um, and then he was really concerned about parental alienation, uh, which at the time I wasn't you know, really familiar with it. I didn't do family law, but I was familiar with it from the perspective of I learned about it in law school and stuff like that. Um, but he was really concerned that the grandmother, um, Donna Adelson, was really trying to drive a wedge between him and the children. And he actually told me that he heard her refer to him as stupid on a Skype call. Um, he couldn't see her in the Skype uh, screen, but he heard her say something to the effect of stupid's on the phone. And he was livid about it. And he was ready to basically kind of go to war over that. Um, did that sort of reference the filing that we're familiar with where grandma says you're stupid and he was seeking to have grandma enjoined from having unsupervised contact with the kids. Yeah, and I, I, I didn't have the opportunity to actually talk to him about that yet because he was killed. Um, but it was my understanding that after that filing, he heard her. Actually, okay. he heard her because that's what he told me. He said, I heard her call me stupid. Um, and but she wasn't in the screen, but he knew her voice, and so he was very upset about that. And then the other thing that he was upset about, he wanted the Holocaust diamond back. So the property of his family property that Wendy had. Yeah, and okay. he wanted that back. All right. So what about money? Was he worried about money? No. Any chance that the case could have been resolved through a million dollar payoff to to Dan Markell from the Adelsons? For in exchange for what? A relocation? No. We've heard some testimony that everything was going well between Dan Markell and Wendy in the few weeks leading up to his death. Do you have any knowledge of that fact? It's, un it's untrue. There's a reason he hired me. He didn't retain me because he needed a friend. <laughs> Tor basically told me on the, on the phone call, he said, look, there's going to be a trial and it's going to be acrimonious and he needs a lawyer that can go into the courtroom and be prepared to fight. He said, that's why I think you could handle this case. And well, that was, we were heading towards a trial. And <clears throat> he certainly, um, you know, I mean, he sent me an email the day before um, talking about how he was irate because Wendy, unbeknownst to him, had actually enrolled or applied to have been enrolled at the School of Arts and Sciences. And she didn't even talk to Dan about it. So he found out the day before when he got called from the school saying that Ben had been accepted. And so he emailed me and said, I'm irate about this. He said, you know, I don't think it's appropriate. Okay. So, no. I mean, so there were a bunch of issues still going on. Yes. It was hot at the time. Yes. All right. And there was some suggestion that Dan Markell was expected to lose all the filings that were currently pending at the time of his death and Wendy was expected to prevail on everything. Do you agree? With that assessment? You mean like with the contempt and all of that? Yeah. No, I mean, I wouldn't have, I would not have got involved if I thought he was going to lose on the contempt. You know, I, my reputation travels with my clients too if they're doing things like that, right? I mean, if you're representing a client who is disrespecting the court, you know, it, it's hard not to feel like that's bleeding off on you and you're disrespecting the court. And in Tallahassee, Florida, if you practice in this circuit, you know, if I disrespect Judge Everett today, 
you know, every judge in this circuit that matters to me is going to know about it before lunch tomorrow. <laughs> and it's just, no. So, no, I would not have accepted. That's why I didn't think I was going to take the case when I read all that. And seeking contempt is kind of a big deal amongst lawyers, right? Yes. I mean, you know, contempt is, you know, it's an ugly, th it's, you know, it's a very ugly kind of prospect. And as a lawyer, that was one of my main concerns is, you know, she was a lawyer. And I did feel like she should be held in contempt. She didn't disclose things on her financial affidavit, and Dan convinced me of that. And but that was it, to be determined, right? But in by my, court. Yes, but in my mind, yes. that was the only reason I took it. Okay. And you know, at the end of the day, you can lose your law license for that. You know, I mean, you would. I guess you would have to report that to the bar. I, I didn't research it, but the court would refer it to the bar if the court found you were in contempt. The court would refer it to the bar and. You know, you could lose your law license. So, yeah, it's pretty serious, you know, in that regard. We heard, I think, from both sides in opening that Mr. Markell was brilliant, but I'm not sure anyone that actually knows about that has told us. Do you have any knowledge of that? Yeah, I mean, it was, it was why I decided to take the case. Um, I liked him. You know, he was actually funny. Like, he had good humor about it. Um, even kind of as acrimonious as all of this was, the kind of the the big picture stuff didn't really he didn't have any anger you know he was angry about the calling him stupid that made him angry but i think in his mind eventually a lot of this stuff would you know would resolve and should resolve um he you know he wasn't he wasn't vindictive you know or vengeful and that was a big part of the reason why i was willing to get involved he was i felt like he was Kind of looking at it like a business deal still with the exception of the stupid comment um and you know so he was funny and i mean obviously smart smarter than i am that's for sure so what are a lawyer's ethical obligations to a client in terms of the client knowing what is in the filings that are being filed on their behalf well i mean i think that depends <laughs> continue examining the witness. Are all attorneys in Florida governed by the rules of professional conduct? Yes, ma'am. And are you, as a 20-year lawyer, familiar with those rules? Yes, ma'am. All right, so what are those rules in reference to can a lawyer put things in a filing that the client doesn't know about or not? You have a duty to keep your client informed. That is an actual affirmative duty on every lawyer, that you have to be in contact with your client, keep them informed of important events that are going on in the in the, the case. There are certain decisions that only the client can make, like whether to testify, things like that. But, you know, there are certain decisions that a lawyer can kind of make, procedural decisions on filing certain things. But you have a duty to keep your client informed of important events.
If Dan Markell was planning to move or seeking re to relocate himself at the time of his murder, would you have known about that? Y yes. And was he planning to do that or trying to do that? Absolutely not. One moment, please, Your Honor. Good afternoon, Mr. Lester. Good afternoon. You uh, started representing Professor Markell in, I think you said May 2014, around that time frame? Yes, sir, I believe so. By the way, at that, at that point in time, what did you specialize in? What was your, were you a divorce lawyer? No. Had you ever done a divorce case? I mean, we had, I had done some, like I worked for other firms, you know, and, um, but for the most part, if I was going to take it, my, me personally, it would have to be no kids involved and like, you know, one of those situations where the assets were already like agreed upon how they were going to be split up. I didn't want to get involved in fighting in cases where kids were going to get hurt. It's not well, how I wanted to use my law license. Excuse me. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for talking with you. What, what did you specialize in? I mean... As, a, as an attorney, I don't think I'm allowed to say I specialize in anything unless I'm board certified. So I'm not board certified in anything. What did you, uh, <laughs> what type of work did you do more of? Um, I, at that point in my career, I'd primarily done a lot of criminal defense work. Okay. So you were a criminal defense lawyer who was going to do a divorce case? Yeah. I guess that's fair to say. Uh, were you aware that Professor Markell's previous lawyer had quit? I saw in the filings that lawyers have withdrawn and yeah um, and you never went to court with Professor Barkell right no nope, he got killed before I had my chance um, you're aware that the court admonished Professor Markell in court um, earlier in the year right I don't know if I was familiar with that I read the papers if it was in the papers I mean look it appeared to me that you know it was very acrimonious and you know there were lengthy pleadings and filings and, and you know it was it was one of the things I talked to Dan about. I said, you know, you need a lawyer. You need to stop drafting voluminous pleadings, and we need to just get this on the rails and focus on what matters. Okay. Um, Ms. Kappelman asked you about court filings and the ethics of lawyers. you recall her asking you that? Yes, sir. Uh, sometimes you file things. You have to keep your clients informed, right? Mm -hmm. But sometimes you file things, and you're able to file things, you don't have to go over every word with your client, right? Yeah, that's fair. No further questions. Redirect examination. No questions, Your Honor. Mr. Webster, you missed that. Down. Thank you, Your Honor.
the approach, Your Honor? You may. Members of the jury, we're going to take a brief break at this point. The bailiff will escort you back to the jury room. We'll resume with the testimony as quickly as we can. How long do you think it'll take Mr. Nolan to find her? <laughs> you well, gotta, gotta go to all the ladies' room. We'll so. advise the bailiff as soon as we have her ready, Judge. All right. All points bulletin on the next witness. <laughs> we'll be in recess at least until 1.50. I have a request from the jury. That when the projector is not needing to be used, turn off, it's causing oh. lights and oh. glare. Yes.
did you enjoy your tour of the courthouse? Um, <laughs> I've been here like twice before. You're good. I'm gonna sit until you're good. You may. <laughs> All rise, you're in the courtroom. Everyone but the witness may be seated. Please raise your right hand, ma'am. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give will be the truth? I do. You may take your seat. Ma'am, please state your name and spell your name. Hi, I'm June. I'm Chinda. It's J-U-N-E, first name, last name, U-M-C-H-I-N-D-A. You don't have to, I don't think you're going to have to lean that close to the microphone. Oh, okay. We can <laughs> let you know if we can't hear you. All right. Like uh, that. Where do you live, ma'am? I'm in South Florida. Do you know Charlie Adelson? Oh, gosh, I'm sorry. Okay. It was my alarm to come here, down here. Okay. Is it silence now? Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Wait, let me just check if it's new. I'm so sorry. It's okay. I don't want it to snooze. Okay. It's okay. <laughs> do you know Charlie Adelson? I do. How do you know him? He's my ex-boyfriend. Do you see him here in the courtroom? I do. Could you please point him out and describe what he's wearing? He's the middle one there with the navy blue suit on. The record reflect the witness has identified the defendant. The record will reflect. When did you date Mr. Adelson? Um, we initially met in, um, I think it was like February or so, and then... February of what year? 2015. Okay. And we didn't um, speak for about eight months. We just had like a brief meeting, and then in October we officially started dating. October of 2015? Yes. And how long did you date him? For roughly two and a half years, Does like officially. Okay. Does June of 2017 sound like the end, correct end of your relationship? Officially, yes. All right. And did you continue to talk to Mr. Adelson after the breakup? We did. When was the last time you spoke to Mr. Adelson? Um, a day or so before his arrest, okay. um, we were playing phone tag and I was supposed to see him. We didn't see each other for a long time, but I was supposed to see him, I, I didn't get to, and then I wrote him back, I saw a message from him. And then the next day he was taken away. All right, so when, that's obviously significantly after the official breakup. Oh, what right, this was in, in April, of last 2022. What was the nature of your relationship after the official breakup? Were you kind of on again, off again, or just casually seeing each other when you were both single, or what was the deal there? I mean, it was a lot of years that went by after our official relationship, so um, there were like different periods of times where we were seeing each other and then casual, but we always stayed in touch throughout the year, so. All right. And do you still have feelings for Mr. Adelson as we sit here today? Um, so he's my last serious boyfriend, so I would say yes, that it's, there's something still there, I care about him, mm -hmm. but obviously I haven't seen him in God knows how long, so. 
All right. And do you recall being interviewed by the Tallahassee Police Department in reference to this case on July 24th, 2018? I do. Okay. And back at that time when you were interviewed, it had been about two weeks since you had talked to him. Does that ring a bell? Something like that, yes. Okay. And, and you had talked to him prior to that interview around your birthday, is that right? On the phone, yes. And when was your, when is your birthday? June 28th. Okay. So is that, that was prior to, obviously prior to his arrest, but just a few months before the trial of Catherine Magbanua? Did you talk to him then as well? Um, I'm not, I don't recall when her trial was. I know she had a retrial, so. Okay. I don't know the date specifically. Okay, but in the in one of those trials, didn't you talk testify that you had spoken to him just the night before that trial? Right. I mean, we were still talking, so yes, I did speak. Okay, so I'm just kind of trying to establish in reference to the important dates of this case, you seem to have had some communication with him pretty close in time to those important dates. Would you agree with that? Yes. But you haven't had any contact with him in reference to what you're going to say here today? No, not since he got arrested. I haven't heard from him. Okay. Were you dating him when what we're calling the bump occurred back on April 19th of 2016? Yes. And are you familiar with what we mean when we say the bump? Is that the money extortion thing from... The thing when Donna Adelson was approached yes. by an undercover officer? Okay, so how far into your relationship with him were you at the time that that occurred? And that's, again, April 19th of 2016. Um, about a year, roughly, I would say. All right, but you began dating officially... Well, from uh, October, so that's not a year. It's okay. um, more like six months. Yeah. What was the status of your relationship, or can you kind of describe for us what your relationship was at that time, April of 2016? Oh, sorry. I'm trying to think of the dates again. Um, so it, the bump was 2016, you said, in April? Yes, ma'am. So this would be about six months into your relationship. Did, were you seeing each other? Seriously, were you seeing a lot of each other? Tell us about Every that. Every day, yeah. Every so, day, okay. And have you previously described the relationship at that time as a fairy tale? Back then, yes. Okay. Perfect. Yes. Inseparable. Yes. Okay, we so the two of you were together quite a lot during that time frame. Yes. Yeah, I basically lived there. Okay, and so you spent most of the time that you were together over at his place? Yes. And is that the place on Whale Harbor? It is. Okay. And did the relationship change at some... Well, let me... Before we leave that, when the bump occurred on April 19th, 2016, did he, Mr. Adelson, tell you about the bump? No. All right. So at some point, did the relationship change around this time frame, April of 2016? I can't say exactly like when it changed because we've had a lot of ups and downs, but mm -hmm. um, I mean, it did change, so I don't know when exactly it was. Okay. I want to draw your attention specifically to the time frame between April and May of 2016. Are you able to tell the jury about some changes you observed in Mr. Adelson's behavior during that time frame? Um, I don't know, like, if it was in that time frame exactly. Do you, okay. Do you recall giving a law enforcement interview in this case? I do. Okay. And that was done on July 24th of 2018? Right. Would your memory have been better back then on these issues as far as the dates that things um, happened? Does it say what date? 
like they didn't ask me specifically when how he was acting when so I don't know exactly what they meant like how he was acting what time okay so you didn't tell them that he began to freak out around that time and act sneaky and go places without telling you where I said that I just don't know at that specific time frame if that was referring to that like okay. right now I, I really have no idea right now okay at some point did a reporter approach you in mr. Adelson's driveway they did all right and was that the first that you learned about this murder yes so mr. Adelson had never even told you during your serious relationship with him that his brother-in-law had been murdered he mentioned that he'd been murdered but there were no details it was just he said we don't know who did it and this would happen so okay so do you know when this reporter approached you like what time or when was it approximately around June 17th of 2016 does that sound right it was right after like I think a political holiday because I had a band-aid on my arm from um, a burn that we went to at a barbecue and it was embarrassing that they took a photo of me with it so I remember that that I still had that band-aid on my arm so okay. it might have been around May or something all right. maybe Memorial Day. Are we sure it was in 2016? Well there's a picture like the reporter has on the internet so whenever that article came out it would be then. Yes, um, so there's a band-aid on my arm, as you can see. All right, and what, are, what is the date of that article? That says June 17th. Um, so when is Memorial Day, May? Yes, what, what is the year on the article? 2016. Okay, so can we agree it was approximately in June of 2016 that you got approached? Um, I believe it was May, but I think they published the article in June. But yes, around June, May, June. I thought the I thought the reporter had the article with them when they approached you. Is that not the case? No, you mean I mean the photo. Like he made that article and posted it, like from the, the interaction. Story. Yeah, from I guess okay. our candid shot or whatever. All right, so maybe you were approached in May and then the article came out in June. I believe that's correct, yeah. Okay, and that was, when that reporter approached you, that was when you found out that there was this whole backstory to this murder that may involve Charlie Adelson. Um I actually didn't find out at that moment. They, they like ran up to me asking if I'm Catherine and I had no idea who that was. So I didn't even know who they were. Um, How come you didn't know who Catherine Magdano was? Not at all, no. All right, so is that the first, did you eventually find out who she was after you learned that name from the reporter? Yes, eventually. Who was she? She was um, Charlie's ex-girlfriend and she also worked for another friend of mine at the front desk. And who's that? Um, Jerry Obed. All right. And what was she working for Jerry Obed at the time that you learned about her, I guess? Learned of her existence? Um, no, so I guess I met her in the front of Jerry's place once briefly, and then um, when I heard of her, my mind went back to that day. But okay. I had no idea, like, her name or anything back then. All right. So you were confused in May of 2016 for her by a reporter. Yes. Right. And then you learned, oh, she was an ex-girlfriend of Charlie Adelson, right? Eventually, yeah. 
Okay, and it, and then subsequent to that, you realized, oh, that's the girl that used to work for Jerry Obed. Yes. Okay, I'm with you. All right, once you found out about this sort of backstory to this homicide and investigation, did the defendant, Mr. Adelson, tell you anything about how to handle the police if you were to be approached by the police? Um, he said if anyone came knocking on the door asking questions, I don't know anything. And at that time, I really didn't know anything still, so. So he told you not to talk to the police? Right, because um, I think he had to go away that weekend or week, and I was at the house by myself, so. And had he been acting strangely for weeks before that article was published? And again, that article was published June 17th, 2016. I believe so. All right, tell us what acting strangely means. Um, I think I said it in my interview that he would kind of run off to places without really giving me an explanation. We kind of had a routine going. We would work, um, go to the gym, and then every night usually see each other at a certain time. But um, it was getting to the point where like he was running late or things were happening and I, I didn't really know the reason. And also, um, I think he was, he just, I just felt like something was different in our relationship. And did you notice that he had begun communicating with Catherine Magbanawa around that time? Um, around, sorry, the time, which the time The two weeks it? prior to the publication of that article, which was published on June 17th, 2016. Two weeks before that. Um, mm -hmm. I can't remember exactly when I found out about Catherine Magbanua. Like I know it was after May, so if it was in that two week period before the article came out, then um, did you say on in your interview with law enforcement that in that time frame you saw him going back and forth with Katie on the calls like and I said oh why do you guys talk so much and also you were commenting about the calls being at odd hours and how you know he's not normally up that early and that's when you saw the call activity on his phone do you remember telling law enforcement that um, I remember saying I saw her name come up or something at some point in time. Again, I don't know if that is the same time around that time. Mm. And also, um, the odd hours thing, I was referring to another girl, I think, that lives in Philippines. Okay. I'm going to draw your attention to page 72. I don't have a binder. I'm going to bring you one. Page 72, lines 7 through 22 on your interview. This is a mini, so if you need to be bigger, I can kind of work on that. But this is 72 here. Okay. And if you'll read to yourself, lines 7 through 22. Okay, so um, so let me ask a question. Yeah. Do you are you still maintaining you're referencing another woman in that comment, or were you talking about Catherine Magbanua? Um, so in that comment, I actually was referring to um, when I found out the phone records of Catherine and Charlie, like speaking in the morning when they showed um, how often they would speak on the phone. All right, thank so, you. Did Mr. Adelson that. ever express any interest in or curiosity to you about who had killed his brother-in-law? Um, he, I mean, yeah, he just said he didn't know who did it, and it was just like an unsolved 
blank mystery. I'm going to ask you to look at um, page 70, I'm sorry, 34. 34 of that same mini transcript in front of you. And if you'll review lines 10 through 15. And just let me know when you're done. 10 through 15? Yes, ma'am. So yes, I see it. And didn't you tell the tell law enforcement back when this interview was conducted, quote, you know, if it wasn't him, he never said, oh, I wonder who killed Dan. Or like if it was just him saying, just like fearing, like he used to have like clothes by his bed in case they came to get him and stuff, like in the middle of the night. He was just very scared that they would come and take him. Is that what you said? So I was saying... Sam, is that what you said? <clears throat> well, no, I didn't say that exactly. Okay. I said, um, Did he never said he wondered you, who You've answered Dan, the question. Uh, don't speak over each other. Please wait for her to ask you a question and answer it. So the transcript is incorrect. Judge, improper question. Objection. Overruled. Is the transcript incorrect? Um, That's as a yes or to no your question, or you mean in general? The question I asked you. I it just doesn't read match from up it. to your question, no. Judge, may we go sidebar? I'm going to request that we not go to sidebar. I have another question to ask the witness. Very well. Did Mr. Adelson ever express any sympathy regarding the death of Dan Markell in your presence? I mean, yes. I'm going to turn your attention to page 84 of the transcript, lines 23 and 24. <coughs> 20, uh, page 84, lines 23 and 24. I'm sorry. You mean section 84? No, ma'am. It's page 84. I think I've got the lines wrong. Let me just take a look. Yes, okay. I was correct. 23 and 24, but you might need to back up a little for context. Didn't you tell law enforcement? That's what was weird to me. I'm always like, well, if you didn't do it, then who do you think did it or something? And he wouldn't ever like show any sympathy or anything. I don't even see on um, page 84. All right, thank you. What about, um, let's go back to Catherine Magbanawa. Did you ever actually meet her or just knew that she worked at Obed's office? I mean, she greeted me when I walked in the door there. So I met her as like a somebody walking in really quick. Okay, but never hung out with her socially or? No, I don't even think I spoke to her really. Okay. Was Catherine Magbanoa, if you know, the girlfriend that was right before you with Charlie? Was, I'm sorry, what? Was she the girlfriend that preceded you or was right before you? No, I didn't even know about her. There was another girl before me. Who was the girl that was right before you? That I know of, it was Whitney Kick. How long did he date Whitney Kick? Um, so initially when I met Charlie in February, I don't know if it was February around then, um, he was with Whitney at that time. So I think he broke up with her a little before we got together. So was there anybody else between Catherine Mag Magbanwa and you other than Whitney Kick, to your knowledge? Um, there was. Okay. Who was that? Um, someone named Jessica. Okay. Did you ever know of Catherine Magbanoa to be employed working for Charlie Adelson? No. Okay. 
during the time th frame of the bump, but so the bump in April, but prior to Ms. McBanawa's arrest in October, was the defendant picking up communication with Catherine McBanawa? Did you notice that he was communicating with her more? I don't know if it was that time frame, like I said. During this time frame that I'm talking about, did the defendant express concerns to you that his phone was being tapped? I mean, it was probably during that time frame, but he did say that at some point. So. Were you still dating the defendant at the time that Catherine Magbanawa was arrested on October 1st of 2016? Yes. What was the defendant's behavior like after her arrest? I mean, I think around that time, um, the media got a hold of the story, so there was... That's not my question. What was the defendant's behavior like after Catherine Magbanawa's arrest? Well, I guess his behavior was just someone that's being conv convicted of murder. Or not convicted, accused of murder, I'm sorry. All right, was he, quote, very scary to be around? Um, I mean, I might have said that. You might have said that or you did say that? I think I did say that because um, we had a fight, so I was afraid one time. Was he, quote, just like angry and different? Um, I guess he was, yeah. Was he violent, agitated, and short-fused during that time frame? I believe so. Did he have trouble sleeping or being alone, didn't want to be home? Do you recall saying that? Yes. When the case came up, did everything just tick him off? Um, yes. Did he start getting really red and screaming and take random walks, like just acting like a crazy person? Um, yes, it's, yeah. Did he p get a second phone around this time frame and possibly even a third phone? Um, I saw one other phone. I don't know about a third, so. Did he start communicating you, with you via the WhatsApp application? He did. Um, he started that because he was also out of the country once, so we started using it then. Did he... Did he sleep with a gun at night and at, in that time frame specifically? So when you say sleep, um, do you mean like physically in the bed or? You tell me. So Where was the gun? He had guns because he has had his, um, his carry license. So he had a few at different places. So in his bedroom. But specifically slept, in this time frame, did he change his habits in reference to the gun? No. So Not he didn't, that I know of. Okay, so he didn't begin sleeping with a gun under his pillow or near his bed where he hadn't before? Um, not sleeping with it. Like, it was in the room, though, so I don't know. All right. Was where? he super stressed and very affected by the arrest of Catherine McBanawa? Yes. But not super stressed and very affected from what you observed by the death of Daniel Markell, was he? I have no idea about that. Well, you said he wasn't. Where is that? In the interview that we just reviewed. I mean, where what you line said, is it? 84. Lines 23 and 24, which we've already done. I think you couldn't find page 84. No, but I think I know what you're talking about. It was, I think I was, I was speculating on it. He didn't say. He wouldn't show like any sympathy or anything, right? I mean, that was my opinion, but I have no idea if he did or not. Well, the question was, did he express it to you? I think his actions did, but he didn't physically, like, verbally say it. 
whose actions expressed grief over the death of Dan Markell. What were those actions? Well, I mean, just somebody concerned, upset over this tragedy and um, everything. But that's the opposite of what you told law enforcement in your law enforcement interview. Well, that was it? like a long time ago. That so was has your memory seven years ago. has your memory improved since 2018? Regarding what? This incident and Charles Adelson's lack of remorse over the death of his brother-in-law. So after that, he I mean, after whatever I said, obviously it's been a long, a lot of years, so he probably expressed sympathy after I said that. All right. What about his mother, Donna Adelson? Did you know her? I did. How was she holding it together during this time frame where the bump was occurring after the bump occurred I think she was also stressed out did you observe her to be crying or ha look, appear as if she had been crying I've seen her like that before yes did she tell you she was on painkillers for stress she may have I'm not sure Did you notice that Donna Adelson was really involved with her grandchildren? I believe she was. And was that Wendy's kids? Yes. Specifically? <coughs> Did Donna Adelson ever express any concerns to you about who killed Dan Markell? <coughs> Um, no. Did you say to law enforcement that the Adelsons weren't ever curious, like, who really killed him? They weren't upset about it, it seemed like. Did you say that? Um, I page, might have said it. Page 50, but, lines 19 through 23. Okay, so what were you asking? I'm sorry. Did you say, quote, like they weren't ever curious, like who really killed him? They weren't upset about it, it seemed like. I did, and I was speculating again, so. Did the defendant ever say anything about something he did coming back to him? Where is that? Why don't you answer the question first? Wait, what was, you said something did, coming back to him, what do you yes, mean? Yes, ma'am. I mean, did the defendant ever tell you about something bad he did coming back to him? I think he was referring to a horoscope. Yes, tell <laughs> us about that, please. Um, from what I recall, I think we were just reading horoscopes and his, I don't even remember at this point, I'd have to look it up again, but. Okay. Page 109. Okay. Did you review this transcript this morning before your testimony today? I reviewed it beforehand in the email that you sent. So which line was it? Page 80, I'm sorry. This is page 109, line 9, through page 110, line 1. And the question is, did you say that the horoscope was something about something you did in the past will come back and take a big toll on your life? And he said, quote, isn't that so true? Wow, that's on point or something. Yes. Was this before or after the arrest of Catherine Magbanwa? I really don't remember that part. <clears throat> Did you ever ask him about what happened to Dan Markell? I did, yes. And what did he tell you? Well, he told me he was shot and 
<coughs> they didn't know who did it. <coughs> okay. What about Wendy Adelson? Were you ever around her during the time that you were dating her brother? Yes. Did she ever express any concern to you about the murder of her child's father? Um, I don't really remember too much of it. Did the topic come up at all regarding the I think death? a topic about her being a single mother came up, and that's all I remember. <clears throat> Did she make a comment to you that things were still hard for her even though Dan was gone. Did she make a comment you're asking? Yes. I think it was something along the lines of that, if I remember. And did at some point Charlie Adelson tell you that he and Wendy were actually fighting about this case? He mentioned that at some point in time. And was Wendy not speaking to the defendant for some period of time because of something to do with this case? I don't know like how long the time was, but I believe, yes, she wasn't speaking to him at one point. And did you know what the thing having to do with this case was that caused them to not be speaking? I have no idea. During the time that you were dating Charlie Adelson, I think you said you would stay over there at the house in Whale Harbor. Was that every night or most every night? Every night. <laughs> Maybe one night like we missed, like, or if he was out of town then. During the time that you were over there, did you have an opportunity to observe large amounts of cash in his residence? I've seen cash there. So. All right. And are you aware of a large safe that's there in the residence? There is a safe. Okay, and during the time that you were dating him, did he have money in that safe, cash? I believe so. All right, and did he have thousands and thousands of dollars, stacks of hundreds? Did you say that? I believe at one point in time. Did you say, quote, hundreds are like dollars to him? I did say that. Did you say that, quote, all of his money is like stapled together, the hundreds in bundles? I believe I did say that. Do you need to review the statement? No, I said, I mentioned like the staples. I just don't remember the bundle part. Are those my exact words or? Page 42, lines <laughs> 22, I'm sorry, 42, lines 20 through 22. Okay, I see it. And did you say all of his money is like stapled? <coughs> all of his money is like stapled together, the hundreds in bundles? Yes. After your breakup with Mr. Adelson, have, has he made any large purchases on your behalf? Has I don't know. You don't know? After our breakup? Yes, like has he bought you a big ticket item? A car, a condo? No. Has anybody tried to tell you what to say here today? No, Has anybody? just myself. Has anybody <clears throat> told you, I don't know, to forget what you said in that interview? Did anybody instruct you to do that, is my question. No. One moment, please, Your Honor. Is there any water around? Uh, no, no. Okay. <laughs> okay, thanks. No further questions. All right, well, let's start right there. Good afternoon. My name is Dan Rashbaum. Hi. Good afternoon. Have we ever met before? No. <laughs> Have you ever seen me before in your life? 
I saw you in on the internet, but no, never in person fair, in my life. Fair enough. Have I ever talked to you on the phone? No, I got a subpoena from you the other day to attend trial here, but I've never physically heard from you. Has anyone from my office, my colleague Kate Myers, anyone from my team at all ever reached out to you about anything? No. Okay. I was actually surprised you didn't get a depo or anything from me, so. I never deposed you, right? No, I haven't heard from you or Charlie or anyone. Okay, so let's just make that clear. Let's clear up a couple other things. Professor Markell was murdered in 2014. Right. Did you know Charlie Adelson in 2014? No. You didn't start dating him until, I think you said, give or take, October of 2015, right? That's right. Okay. So any type of feelings he had about the murder of Professor Markell in 2014, you wouldn't know anything about that, right? Right. <laughs> okay. We're gonna do a little bit more of this in a little bit, but that time period that Ms. Kappelman was asking you that you were confused about where Charlie was acting odd. Right. You know what the bump is, right? The Donna thing, the yeah, extortion. Where, where law enforcement um, approached Donna Adelson on the street. Yes. You probably watched, watched it on TV. Yes, everywhere. Right. And you know there was a wire involved in that, correct? I do. And uh, that's the point in time uh, that Charlie Adelson was acting kind of weird, right? Yes, I believe so. Let's go back a little bit. When you dated Charlie, uh, did you go out a lot when you were dating? It was like, 50-50, but yes, in the beginning we went out a lot every weekend if we could do nights sometimes too. Did he work a lot? A lot. He started early in the morning and came home late at night a lot of days? Almost pretty much every day, but like Sunday and Saturday sometime. Saturday, Sunday. And uh, he worked most, day, most of the time six days a week? Yes. And his work would take him all over the southern part of the state, right? Right. He'd be in the car a lot, right? Yes. When he dated you and he was in the car, did he bother you a lot by calling you all the time while he was driving? Um, I He knew I was at work and we would see each other before leaving the house and then when we got back, so he didn't have a need to really call me on his way to work. He would text me and we would text sometimes throughout the day if I had a chance. Okay. Now, you said Charlie keeps a lot of cash at his house, right? Um, I probably said that, yes. Okay. And he staples his cash, correct? That's what I saw, yes. Okay. And again, you saw this cash at his house in 2016, right? When you dated him, well after the murder. <laughs> oh, yeah, well, way after that, yeah. Now, there is this discussion about a gun and sleeping with it and sleeping with it. He keeps a gun in his nightstand next to his bed, right? Right. Are you aware that that habit started on July 18, 2014? I have no idea. But ever since you knew him, he kept a gun on his nightstand, right? Not on it. In, um, in the drawer in his nightstand, apologies. I think it was in his safe and in the car. Okay. But. By the way, his house has a lot of camera equipment, right? Yeah. Like a lot of camera equipment. Right? Yes. 
Are you aware that that camera equipment was installed within two weeks of Professor Markell's murder? Are you aware of that? No. But it was there when you were there, correct? Right. How about the barbed wire behind his house? His barbed wire, right? Yes. Are you aware that that was installed after Professor Markell's murder? No. Did you ever go to the Adelson Institute? I did. Did you see all the camera equipment there? I didn't notice. Now, I think you talked about this, that there were a lot of, uh, that media was starting to come around, right? Yes. And this was in 2016 after the bump and after some arrests. Right. And after the Tallahassee Police Department released an affidavit saying that Charlie Adelson was part of the murder. Do you recall that? Right. And you asked him, and he said he didn't do it, right? Hearsay. Sustain that it's all certain hearsay. Move to strike. Members of the jury, you're to disregard the last question by Mr. Rauschenbaum. Please continue. Did Ms. Kappelman just ask you whether, what, whether you asked Charlie Adelson about the murder? Um. Not in the same context, but yes, basically. Judge, may I go sidebar? I, don't, I want to make sure I don't step on it. You may continue with your examination. Let me ask it this way. After you asked Charlie Adelson if he knew anything or participated in the murder, did you continue to date him? Yes. Did you continue to stay at his house almost every day? Yes. This, we worked every day until we broke up. You didn't have any worry about your safety, right? No. By the way, during this time period. Oh, can I interrupt you, sir? I did have a worry about. Um, Hold on. Oh. They're going to need to ask you the question. You just don't get to start off with a statement unless it's clarifying the last question. It was clarifying it. Then you may clarify your answer as to the last question. So, um, I'm sorry, the last question one more time because now I've forgotten. Please ask again. I have forgotten it as well. <laughs> Did you continue to stay at his house and spend time with him, I believe? Um, that was the question. You, oh, now I remember. Okay, you asked if I felt safe. So, at one point in time, he was getting death threats and all this stuff. So at that time when we were together, I kind of felt unsafe with people recognizing us or something like that. Did you ever feel unsafe? Do you ever think that Charlie Adelson was going to hurt you? No. Now, 
during the time after these media reports, etc., did Charlie take trips overseas? Yes. Did he always come back? Yes. Did he once tell you he wasn't up? Uh, withdraw. Withdraw. Ms. Kappelman asked you about how he was angry, how he was upset. Do you recall those questions? I do. At that time, there were Dateline specials being aired, right? Uh, yes, more than Dateline, but. And what was his reaction to these media reports? I think he was just flustered and stressed out and a ton of different emotions. Was he angry? Yes. Now, you were interviewed by law enforcement in 2018. I think that's what we established finally today, right? Yes. And your testimony then was essentially the same as it was today, correct? Uh, my testimony, oh, from being, yes, yes. They asked you pretty much the same questions. Yes. We just went over my transcript, basically, so. That was in 2018. There's nothing today that they asked you different, is new from 2018, right? No, my memory just didn't remember the dates, but no. But their questions were the same. There's no new topic. Right. When was Charlie Adelson arrested? I believe it was April 2022. So four years after they asked you those very same questions, correct? Correct. May I have one moment, Your Honor? One moment, Your Honor. Just double check. Charlie ever told you to lie? Has, sorry, <clears throat> has he ever told me a lie? Yeah. He has, yes. He's told you to lie? Oh, I thought you said a lie. Has I'm Charlie sorry. ever told you to lie? No, never. No further questions. Redirect. Right. <laughs> so the defense was trying to get you to move the time period of when Charlie was acting crazy and angry to when the news articles were being published. 
Right. But in your law enforcement interview, you articulated that he had been acting weird for weeks prior to that first news article. Isn't that right? And you didn't That's know what why. That's what I remember, yes. Ma'am? Yes? Yes. Okay. And did they, they raised, oh, didn't he tell you? He didn't have anything to do with it. Did he tell you that he had purchased a vehicle for Ms. McVano or given her a vehicle? He didn't tell me, but I saw that in the 2020 thing and asked him about it. Okay, and he admitted he gave her a vehicle. He said his father, it was an old car that his father Did he give canceled. her a vehicle? I don't know. Did he mention giving her or contributing to a breast augmentation for Catherine McBanois? Um, he said he never contributed to that. If you look at tab one of the binder in front of you, the trial on May 23rd, 2022 should be your first tab. And if you'll look first on page 1197, lines 19 through 24. Are you with me? Yes. Um, can you I say the lines the again? What were the oh, lines? Yes, ma'am. It's 1197 is the page, and the lines are 19 through 24. Right. Did you previously testify? Question. Did he put you on the pay roll at the Adelson Institute after you broke up? No. Do you recall him telling you that he gave Catherine Magbanoa a car? Answer, I do. Page 1216. That's what he said, yes, at the time. And would you turn to 1216 now? I'm there, yes. Oh, okay. And in that testimony did you also also testify questions so now your testimony is that he said told you he paid for half of her breast augmentation um he said that at one point but i think it was a joke no further questions you may step down on the work must be recalled by other party Judge, we, we do have her uh, on the subpoena, uh, so there's a possibility. You may step down. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Please call your next witness, please. Yeah. State calls Wendy Adelson. Adelson, you remain under oath. You may be seated. Ms. Adelson, we've got two points we need clarification on from you. Um, when we talked about your relationship with uh, Jeffrey Lacasse, we talked about a occasion on July 13th, 2014 it would have been the Sunday before the murder. And on that occasion, did you at your residence that evening, in the context of discussing the relocation issue with involving you and your children moving to South Florida, did you say that Charlie, your brother, this defendant, had explored all options to resolve the problem, including hiring a hitman and it would cost either fifteen or $50,000? No. 
And did you have a conversation with Jeffrey Lacoste at your residence that night where you said you wanted to share something in confidence with him? No. Did you ever say that your brother had seriously hired a hitman where it, you weren't repeating the joke? You no. were serious. All right. And second point for clarification involves that dinner where you got sick at the t dinner table. You recall which, which evening I'm speaking of? I do. This would have been about two weeks to a month after the homicide, I believe. Okay, and at, on that occasion, did you ever tell Jeffrey Lacasse that Charlie had referred to the dinner as a celebration dinner? No. Did you ever tell Jeffrey Lacasse that it was a celebration dinner? No. No further questions. Cross exam. Very briefly. Good afternoon. During your uh, interrogation, do you recall Jeffrey Lacoste's name coming up? Yes. And do you recall that it was Jane McPherson who brought up his name, not you? Yes, correct. And do you recall as a result of his name being brought up, he was considered a suspect? Yes. And do you recall that Detective Isom asked you a lot of questions about him. Yes. And he asked you about his car. Yes. And he asked you about his travel schedule. Yes. And he asked you for his information so that he could speak with him, correct? Correct. But you didn't bring up his name, right? No. You didn't try to frame Jeffrey <coughs> Lacoste for any murder, right? Absolutely not. In fact, Jane McPherson was the one who brought up his name, correct? She was. I have no further question. Please approach. But Jeffrey Lacasse's name did come up while you were in the interview room, being interviewed in reference to the shooting, right? Jane McPherson brought him up. She, she was in the room with you during the interview? For some of it, not for the whole time. Okay, but during the part where Jeffrey Lacasse's name came up, she was in the interview, interview room with you? Yes, she brought him and, up. And this is the same interview that we've referenced previously where you were taken from the restaurant to be told about what happened with Dan. Yes. Nothing further. You may step down, ma'am. Will Ms. Adelson be recalled by either the state or the defense again? I certainly hope not, Your Honor. You remain under subpoena. Please call your next witness. Jeffrey LaCasse. Mr. Lacoste, you remain under oath. You may be seated. All right, 
Mr. Lacasse, I want to take you back to July 13th, 2014. This is going to be the Sunday before the homicide that we're here about. Did you see Wendy Adelson that evening at her residence here in Tallahassee? Yes, after we returned for, from dinner and a movie, we went back to her residence. Yes, ma'am. All right. And at some point that evening, did the issue of the relocation battle that was going on back in the summer of 2013 come up? It did. And is that the issue we've already touched on, which has to do with her wanting to move to South Florida with the children and filing a petition to do so in the courts? That's right. And by extension, the issue of being stuck in Tallahassee. Okay. And while discussing that issue, did Ms. Adelson make some statements to you about her brother, Charlie? She did. And what were those statements? She asked to speak to me confidentially in a very serious tone of voice, told me that Charlie had investigated all possible options to take care of the problem of Danny Markell, including hiring a hitman, which would cost about $15,000. And I later revised that and thought maybe it was $50,000, but the dollar amount was the only thing in question. She definitely said that Charles Idelson had looked into hiring a hitman to kill Danny Markell. And when did she say Mr. Adelson had looked into hiring a hitman? When the relocation was denied the previous summer. Okay. All right. And the dollar amount, so she either said 15 or 50, you're not sure which? That's correct. Okay. And when she said this, what was her demeanor like? She was very serious. All right. So definitely not the to be confused with the TV joke? No, I'd heard that joke repeatedly. I knew that joke. This was something very different. This was chilling, a little scary, made my stomach flip. I found it disturbing. Um, the joke was said in a lighthearted manner, when, and this was not said in that way. This was serious and said confidentially. All right, thank you. And I wanna, well. Okay, I think we should go from there to the next day, which is going to be July 14th, 2014, the Monday before the murder. Yes, ma'am. Did you see Wendy Adelson on that day? Yes, yeah, she, I can't remember if I contacted her or if she contacted me, but she was excited to see me. And I wasn't so sure about that because the night before, we'd had an awkward conversation at the conclusion of that night, and I had told her that she didn't want to do this anymore, that she could just send me a text and I wouldn't you know, take any offense, we would just you know, break up. Um, so I, I didn't get that text, instead I talked to Wendy Adelson and she was excited to see me. All right, so what did you do? Um, well then she needed to call me back and it went from enthusiastic, uh, her enthusiasm about seeing me to let's just meet at yoga tonight, uh, go in separate cars. So there was a real shift in about 30 minutes. Did you go to yoga? We did. We went to yoga. All right. And after yoga, was there a discussion about your relationship and the status of your relationship? Yeah, a very brief one. I mean, yoga is not a great place to talk, obviously. So while we were sitting there, um, she seemed very cold. And I kind of got the, the feeling that it was over, that, that this was it. Um, so as we walked to the car, I tried to talk to her about the relationship. And that didn't go well. And so I just kind of put up my hands and, and walked away, feeling sad that this was it. All right, and as you walked away, was that the end or was there more conversation after you began to walk, walk no, away? No, she called out to me and I uh, walked back towards her. Um, and she was deeply curious. Well, during that, let me back up slightly. During that conversation, she, she didn't have any interest in spending any time with me for the rest of the week, so it kind of confirmed, like, you know, this is over. Mm -hmm. um, but then when she called me back, she had a series of detailed questions about what I would be doing on Friday. And Friday is going to be July 18th, right? Yes. And that's the date of the homicide? That's exactly right. What were her, in her inquiries of you regarding that date? I had a trip planned to Tennessee. Uh, she was aware that I was planning to leave about 11 a.m. Uh, on Friday. I need to get to Atlanta for an early dinner, so with traffic. Uh, she knew I was departing at 11. Um, and at, at the yoga studio or in the parking lot, she had asked um, if I was still going, if I didn't go, why not, what route I would be taking. taking. Um, 
a lot, a lot of a bizarre amount of interest in that trip that didn't make sense to me at the time, given that she didn't want to spend time with me. And how does it make sense to you now? Well, if I had left on my trip at the scheduled time that she had known about for quite a while, um, I would have driven pretty close to Danny Markell's house about the same time as at the murder um, in a similar looking car to the suspect vehicle. What type of vehicle did you drive? I drove a 2004 Nissan Sentra that was silver metallic gray color. So if you had followed your original plans, you would have been passing by the Markel residence or nearby there around the same time as the killers were fleeing? Yeah, I would have been at Capitol Circle in Thomasville. Sure, I would have been on the same cell tower, for example. I think my life could have been pretty complicated had I taken my original plans. All right, so you didn't, I guess, take the original plans? No, I did not. I had made a last moment, uh, last minute decision the night before to leave Thursday night instead. I had not informed uh, Ms. Edelson about that because we weren't speaking. Actually, no, I don't, I don't know that anyone for sure that anyone in Tallahassee knew I had changed my plans, just the people at the, the other end. All right, so you were actually in Tennessee at the time of the homicide. I was. And when you were, we've heard you were called in as a potential suspect um, and apparently named by a Jane McPherson. Do you know who that is? I do. Okay, who is that? That was a friend of Wendy Adelson's and she was a doctoral student in our program. Um, I had a, not much relationship with her, just to kind of, a, a working relationship. We'd worked on a couple of projects together, but I didn't know her very well at all. But someone that knew that you were had been dating Wendy. Yeah, time. I think she was a confidant of uh, of Wendy Adelson's. Yes, for sure. Okay, so you get called in, and were you able to provide documentation to show that you were in Tennessee and not in Tallahassee? Yeah, I was excluded uh, fairly quickly because uh, the investigators found uh, Kmart surveillance. Uh, footage of me at a Kmart in Tennessee using my credit card with my cell phone showing me there shortly after the murder so it was impossible that I was the shooter. All right and then was there also some similar type coincidences around the time of the trip that the killers made in June? Yes um, on June 6th I had a business trip to Gainesville and I departed at 11 a.m on a Friday, June 6th, which Ms. Adelson would have known about by March. So really I take two trips out of Tallahassee in my car the, the whole spring and summer semester. And both times, Hitman tried to kill Danny Marco. Okay. Any further contact with Wendy after the yoga date? We, uh, about 10 days after the murder, she reached out through a mutual friend and we had a few phone calls. And during one of those phone calls, did you learn about a dinner where Wendy had become ill at the table? Yes, I did learn about that. And what did you learn about that dinner? Um, that she went out to dinner with Charlie for what he called a celebration dinner. He said something to her, she spontaneously vomited on the table. And this would have been within how much time after the homicide? Within a few weeks. Was it specified that the celebration was in reference to Dan Markell's death as opposed to anything else? Wasn't specified. Okay. But whatever it was, that's the dinner where she vomited. That's right. That's right. One moment, please. Let's shift gears a, a teeny bit, okay? When you and Miss Adelson were dating, there were occasions when she would drive, right? Yes. Did she have a good sense of direction? I don't know. You're aware that when she was married to 
she lived in uh, Professor Markell. She lived on the house on Trescott, right? Yes. And uh, when you were dating Wendy, would she often use Trescott as a shortcut to get from one place to another? She used it a few times when I was in the car, if that's what you're, you're asking. She I think did that on June 27th, the uh, day we departed to Gainesville at 11 a.m. on a Friday. I think you said in one of your interviews that she would do that at least 100 times, drive by the house? That was a figure of speech. Okay. Now, you mentioned, uh, we'll start with the joke, the yes. bad joke. Yes. You mentioned uh, this TV joke, how it was lighthearted, bad humor, certainly in the context of what happened, but it was a joke. Yeah, it was dark humor, I would say, but it was clearly a joke, yes. And do you recall that joke being given at that Yardbird dinner? I don't. Could it have been given at that Yardbird dinner? It could have, but I don't recall it, and I actually think I might remember that. I'm sure you given do. Given what happened. I think one thing that has been established is you believe that Wendy Adelson tried to frame you for Professor Markell's murder, right? I'm suspicious that there was an effort made in that, that way, yes. And so that has affected your viewpoint, correct? Sure. Well, let's talk about your viewpoint. And we have to go a little bit back and repeat a couple things to put it in context. So you meet with Charlie Adelson. He tells you that he's in the, uh, he's friends with people in the criminal element. You say, thanks for a great meeting, correct? Send him a nice text. The next day I sent him a text, yes. You don't go to the police? No, I don't go to the police. Okay. You then hear that Charlie's made a joke many times about this TV being cheaper than hiring a hitman. Heard the joke twice. Okay. You don't go to the police? No. Then in June, at a time when Wendy Adelson is breaking up with you. She sits you down and she says, I have to confide the biggest secret in my life. That a year ago, my brother actually looked into hiring a hitman. That's your testimony here today, right? You said in June, sir? In June? I'm sorry, in June, yes, in, 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 I'm sorry, in July. In can July. You, can you restate that? I'm sorry. Yeah, I'll do it again. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll try to keep it lower this time. <laughs> In July of 2014, yes. about a week before the murder, when you're breaking up with Wendy Adelson, or things are seriously not good, she sits you down and she says, Jeffrey, I've got to confide in you. My brother actually looked into hiring a hitman. That's your testimony here today. No, she didn't sit me down. She said it in passing, and she had a habit of boarding out things that weren't in her own self-interest. Um, but she did do that. She did make that statement, yes, sir. And it was chilling to you. It was. Unlike the joke, you thought it was real. It was real, yes. Did you go to the police? I did not. And then you break up. Kind of. She strung me along for another week, as you know. Mostly, yeah, but kind of. Well, the murder happens, and you get called in as a suspect of the murder. Right. And you're upset at that point. Yes, I was upset. And you have a first interview with the police, and then you have a second interview with the police. Yes. And during the second interview with the police, you talk solely about Wendy Adelson. Yeah, I think that's right. I, I felt like I needed to 
said they needed to look at Wendy Adelson as well. That was the point of that talk, yes, that, sir. That was the point of that talk. Yes. And you even, you, you don't mention actually Charlie Adelson at all in that second interview. I already had done so, so yes, sir, correct. So that second interview, you talked just about Wendy Adelson. And in fact, you're so uncomfortable in the interview, you tell the police that. You say, I'm so uncomfortable, and, and Detective Isom asked you why. Do you recall that? It wasn't a Detective Isom. Okay, I'm sorry. The detective who was interviewing you asked you why. I, I don't, you have to remind me on that. Well, let me remind you what you yeah. said. You said, because it's hard for me, because if she would take me back right now, I would go back to her. Yeah, I was still under her spell to some degree. I was, I would say I was, uh, Fairly pathetic at that point. I would acknowledge that. Yeah. So let me understand this because I, I want to make sure I've got it right. I don't want to put yeah. words in your mouth. Sure. Wendy Adelson has told you that her brother looked into hiring a hitman sometime in 2013. You, he gets murdered. He does. You go to an interview, and during that interview, you're still thinking about staying with Wendy Adelson. You don't want to talk badly about her because you still want to be with her. You're talking about the July 23rd interview specifically? Yes. Yeah, it only been a week. It was still pretty fresh. I was still pretty mixed up. That's right. Okay, well, let, let's see how mixed up you were. In after that. So then you're clearly broken up at that point. We can agree, right? Actually, uh, I, would, I would say yes, functionally, but I've testified before that Ms. Adelson and I had conversations in August where she behaved as if we were still together and we had a conversation that finally ended it, initiated by me. Now, practically, we were broken up. You never dated, you never went on a date with her again, right? I never saw her again other than our okay. courtroom, right? Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> Then she tells you, according to you, that my client, Charlie Adelson, says that she had a celebration dinner with Charlie and that the celebration dinner was about the murder of Professor Markell. I don't recall saying that last part. But that's how you took it, right? I worried that was the case. I told the police, and my understanding is Wendy conceded she threw up on her dinner table. Do you know that the first time you told the police that was in March of 2015? I do know that. So what happened in September of 14? What happened in October of 14? What happened in November of 14? What happened in December of 14? January of 15? February of 15? You still didn't think that was important to tell the police? I'm happy to answer that. I think you deserve an explanation on that. Um, I... You may have noticed in my March 6, 2015 interview, I come in with notes, big pile of notes. Those notes are written in July of August. They're written pretty quick after the, the, the murder. I didn't come in right, in right away, partially, because I was scared of your client. I was scared of the repercussions if I went on the record further about my suspicion. So I was reluctant to come back in because I was frankly scared. Oh, I, I get it. You were, you, were, you were scared of him in August of 14, but you weren't scared of him in, in, in March of 2015. Now I decided to man up. I decided it was a homicide and needed to man up. That's the decision I came Right. To. You weren't scared to tell him that my client had actually looked into a hitman a year earlier. That didn't scare you. You could tell him that in July. No, I was. Of, I was hold on, sir. Let me ask the question. Fair enough. In July of 2014... You told police that Charlie Adelson, you heard, actually looked at hiring a hitman. You weren't scared to tell him that. I asked for police protection. I was scared. You told them that in July of 2014. Isn't that correct? Yes, in the same conversation I said, can I get some assurances? Can I get some protection? I have something I want to tell you. I'm scared to tell you. But you were too scared to tell him about a celebration dinner comment, and you waited almost half a year to tell him? Well, I, I, I did wait half a year to tell them, but the uh, notes I brought in were written right after that interview. I also wanted to get my thoughts together because I thought this day might come. And I wanted, in those first two interviews, there was a lot going on. It was pretty traumatic, so I wanted to collect my thoughts. So that's what I was doing, in addition to being pretty frightened and having to get over that idea. Isn't it true that those comments never happened 
and you're upset because you believe that this family tried to frame you for murder. Everything I'm saying is true. I'm sure it is. May I have a moment, Your Honor? Move to strike the I'm sure it is comment. I'll withdraw it. It's withdrawn. Please disregard, members of the jury. <coughs> I have no further comments for this. Questions. Yeah. Or questions. <laughs> This may seem like a fine point, but I want to make sure it's crystal clear. When Mr. Rashbaum was asking you about the hot tub conversation, Mr. Rashbaum said that his client said that he was friends with people in the criminal element. Is that exactly what was said? The word I recall is he had connections and friends on both sides of the tracks. Okay. Connections to criminal the criminal element. Element. And Particularly, there was the Cuban neighborhood uh, comment that I repeated to the TPD later. Gotcha. Actually, on July 21st, first interview, I mentioned that comment. <laughs> okay. How many pages of notes do you have in reference to this case? Like right now or over the last nine years? <laughs> I mean, kind of over the last nine years. Yeah. Uh, I'm a researcher by training. I'm an analytic person by nature. So those six months, it was pretty obsessive. I was reviewing every text message, every email, writing, writing, writing. I condensed it down. I think if you watch the videotape, you would see me bring in three, four, five pages. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I would say I wrote probably a hundred pages uh, before I came in to see them the third time. Going through every receipt, yes, every detail, yes, partially out of what, what motivation? Well, pretty traumatic. So fear was part of it. Like if they can catch the people that did this, I'll be safe. That was a, a big piece of it. Mm -hmm. Also, this was a brutal murder, and I wanted to see justice done, and I did not want to leave something sitting on the shelf. If I was in the possession of something that could help, I wanted to, to help. And you did, isn't it true that you didn't know what was going to end up being important out of all the nuggets you dug out of the phone and everywhere else? I had no idea. And I also told them repeatedly, I hope and pray this wasn't Wendy and Charlie Adelson. But just in case, here's the stuff I have. And Mr. Rashbaum asked you about why didn't you go to the police when you learned that Mr. Adelson had in fact looked into hiring a hitman. This was, this, just to reiterate, the statement was made the Monday before the murder, is that that's right? That's correct. Okay. And that's the statement that where Wendy's relating it to you. Yes. All right, so that's going to be in 2014. Yes. Okay, and she's making a statement about something that occurred in what year? 2013. All right, why didn't you go to the police with this information? Because it was a past tense thing she was reporting. I did not sense that it was a present danger. I didn't know hitmen had already visited Tallahassee. I didn't realize there was an active murder plot. In hindsight, should you have gone to the police with this information? Yes. One moment, please. Nothing else, Your Honor. So the cause you must have done. Mr. Rock, you have something that you need to Maybe go sidebar briefly. Approach.
jury room. this point well I think what may make sense first um, with all respect is maybe let them just ask him whether he has the notes first and whether they can get them rather than do an inquiry I don't think the state has done anything wrong well I think that directly goes to factor one whether there is a violation but yes <laughs> I, I, I don't think there's a violation but I think I'm entitled to the notes if he has them and then I we can recall them very well does your client need to use the restroom or take a break? Yes, Your Honor. All right. We'll take a 10-minute break, and we'll go back on at 3.40. Ms. Kappelman, how many or how many more witnesses do you plan to call before we... I have two, Your Honor, but we can see how long the next one takes. Okay. Who are the two? 3.40 to start again.
Everyone may be seated. Why are they ready back there? He said he did the notes for nine years. Okay, just okay. Without the jury or with? With. Okay. <laughs> It'll be quick, Your Honor, I promise. One, what, what, one question that becomes nine? I didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> Louder, please. <laughs> Just keep it. It's for closing. These questions pretty soon. He's saying it's really good. All rise, jury and Everyone may be seated. Members of the jury, the defense is going to have a very brief recross of Mr. Lacoste. Mr. Lacoste, those notes, pages and pages of notes, did you provide them to the uh, prosecutors? No, they were destroyed. I went, uh, used them to guide my interviews with investigators, and then I destroyed them. You destroyed them? Yes. Why'd you destroy them? I don't know they would have been of any use to anyone else. They were just little talking points for me. We went through every single thing on my notes. It was on videotape, and then I got rid of the notes. So when you were on the videotape, you were reading your notes? Well, I was using them as prompts to remember to talk about each thing. The investigator guided the interview, so sometimes we didn't stick straight to them. But I made sure everything on the note got discussed with investigators. But we wouldn't know that because we can't see them today, right? No, but you can watch the videotape of my interview with Craig Isom and see what's on the notes. Oh, I can see the actually the writing on that videotape? I, I guess not, but that's the, that's the material that was covered. Sir, truth is, you destroyed those notes, and we can't review them, right? Yes. No further questions. Re-redirect. from a law enforcement officer requiring you to do something with your personal notes? No, I don't think I even needed to create notes. I chose to, to organize my thoughts to talk to Investigator Isom, but it was to help me make sure I covered what I wanted to cover. And of course, he ended up asking most of the questions anyway. That's how it works. And everything in the notes is included in the interviews? Yes. It was provided to 
surprise it too long to us. Yeah. Okay, nothing further. Thank you. Yes, that's right. Just call your next one. Ryan Fitzpatrick. Please raise your right hand, sir. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give will be the truth? Yes, sir. You may take your seat. Sir, please say your name and spell your name. Ryan Fitzpatrick, R-Y-A-N-F-I-T-Z-P-A-T-R-S-E-K. Where do you live, sir? Lantana, Florida. And what line of work are you in? I'm in roofing now. Okay. Do you or did you at some time have a relationship with Charlie Adelson? Yes, ma'am. Were you guys friends? Yes, ma'am. How close were you? Very close. What time frame were you close friends with Charlie Adelson? From about uh, the time that I moved to South Florida and around about 2012. Um, and then as years passed, we grew a lot closer. Until when? Until about 2018, 19-ish. Alright. Did you spend a lot of time together? Yes, ma'am. Did you talk to him daily? Yes, ma'am. Did you know his family? Yes, ma'am. Meet his girlfriends? Yes, ma'am. Alright, can you, do you see him here in the courtroom today? Yes, ma'am, I do. Would you point him out and describe what he's wearing? Uh, blue suit, light blue tie, white shirt. Let the record reflect the witness has identified the defendant. The record will reflect. Was the defendant, Mr. Adelson, very close to his sister, Wendy? Yes, ma'am. If you know, how did the family, the Adelson family, feel about Dan Markell? Not fond. And did that include Charlie Adelson? Yes, ma'am. I mentioned the girlfriends. Did Mr. Adelson have a lot of girlfriends? Yes, ma'am. Was one of them Catherine Magbanoa? Yes, ma'am. Did you ever have an occasion to meet her? I think in passing I might have met her once or twice, but I didn't have a personal relationship with her, no. Did she stand out to you as being someone special or of more importance to him than any of the other women Judge, in his life? Objection leading. Sustain, please rephrase your question. It's, it's a yes or no question. Did she stand out to him as being somehow special or different from the other women in his no, life? Are you familiar with the defendant's practice of stapling his money? Yes, ma'am. Do you know the denominations or how he would staple it? Um, 10 100s would be a thousand. Easier to count that way. At the time that Dan Markell was murdered, how did you learn of the murder? I. I can't remember. They never spoke about it, so. And when you yeah. say they never spoke about it, who was that? The family never spoke of it. So you didn't learn about the murder from your close friend? I do not believe so, no. Not directly. <clears throat> right after the murder, did Mr. Adelson tell you that his girlfriend, Catherine Magbanawa, was extorting money out of him? No, ma'am. Does that seem like something he would have mentioned to you? Yes, ma'am, probably, I imagine so. When law enforcement posing as a thug approached his mother in what we're referring to as the bump, did he tell you about that? I don't recall, no, ma'am. He didn't tell you that he thought that the person that approached his mother was either the FBI or someone posing as Rivera's brother? I can't remember if Charlie directly said that to me or not, so I, you know, I don't know. It's been so long. Okay. Did he ever make a statement to you about murder? Charlie 
as you heard in testimony and depots that he made a lot of tasteless jokes and he said something along the lines of you can get away with anything you can get away with murder if you keep your mouth shut when was that statement made Jeez, I, years ago before or after this murder it would be after was his behavior after the, are you familiar with the arrest that occurred in may may of 26 may of 2016 i should have clarified katie's arrest yes yes ma'am and did his behavior change at that point yes ma'am and did he seem relieved and less stressed out after she got arrested no ma'am he did not um what what was his demeanor after her arrest nervousness uh agitation um stress so he seemed to get more stressed out after she was yes ma'am was he weird like that before like during the between the time of the murder and the time of Catherine Magdano's arrest I mean, to say he was weird um like that like the no, behaviors you just no, described not that weird all right and are you familiar with some barbed wire that he had mm -hmm. around his residence no but I kind of like that idea <laughs> did you when was the last time you were at his residence at Oh, the name is escaping me. Whale Harbor. It would had to have been around probably the summer of 2018. Okay. And when you were out there, when you were at his residence in the summer of 2018, did y'all use the pool area? Yes, ma'am. He's got a nice grotto-style pool out there. Very nice. Yes, ma'am. And did you observe when you were out there barbed wire around this perimeter of the pool? No, I don't, I don't think so, no, ma'am. All right, what about weapons? Did Charlie Adelson frequently carry or have weapons around him? Charlie had a gun, yes. Where did the gun stay, if you know? I, I, On his person, in the safe, bedside table? Uh, I, I mean, I don't know what his regular practice was, but I can imagine he would put it by his bed when he slept. All right. Was that just the one gun that you were aware of, or did he have a bunch of guns? I believe he had more, but I can't testify to that. Okay. So when you were in the residence, there weren't guns laid out in the residence? Not, not like my house, no. <laughs> <laughs> did you have a falling out of some kind with Mr. Adelson? Yes, ma'am. When did that occur? I would say about the last time that I recall vaguely being at his residence, probably about the summer of 2018. Okay, and you guys have filed lawsuits against each other or just one direction? Charlie had filed a lawsuit against myself and others. Uh, it's since been dismissed, so. All right, and so you don't like the guy anymore? Fair to say? I mean, I'm, he's not a big fan, no. Okay, and you said, have you said some ugly things about him on social media and that sort of thing I've said it to him all right and is are you here to try to like bring him down no I don't want to be here at all <laughs> were you here so, pursuant to a subpoena yes ma'am okay. one moment please Did you give a deposition in this case previously? 
In Catherine's case, yes. Back in 2021? I believe so, yes, ma'am. Okay, I'm gonna approach and have you read. Six and forty-seven. What about Mr. There's no question. So I don't know if she's refreshing. Yeah, I'm gonna refresh your recollection with your deposition. I'm, there's been no question to refresh. Uh, did you say that he told you about the bump? If I said it there, then I said it there. Okay. I mean, it's just been years, so it's hard I, to recall. I understand. And I'm tired. Would it refresh your recollection to review the deposition to see exactly what you said? Yes, ma'am, it would. All right, page 46 and 47. And you can scroll like Does that refresh your recollection? Yes, ma'am. So did Mr. Adelson tell you about the extortion attempt on his mother in 2016? Yes, ma'am. But definitely never told you about Catherine McBanawa extorting him in 2014? No, ma'am. Or 2015? No, ma'am. No further questions? You met Katie once or twice, right, Magbanawa? I believe so, yes, sir. You didn't know her personally? No, sir, I did not. But Charlie mentioned to you uh, that the father of Katie's kids tried to run him off the road? Yes, sir. Tried to kill him? Yes, sir. And that was in 2014? Vaguely, yes, sir. If that's what I you know, testified to, then yes. Charlie talks a lot, right? Indeed he does. Repeats himself a ton, right? Yes, sir. Now, I think uh, Ms. Kappelman just refreshed your memory that you were aware of the bump, that Charlie told you about the bump. Yes, sir. Okay. By the way, did you communicate with Charlie on WhatsApp? Yes, sir. You ever talk about murder on WhatsApp with him? No, sir. <clears throat> Ms. Kappelman asked you about whether Charlie started to act nervous at the round at the time of around Katie's arrest. Do you recall those questions? Yes, sir. Are you aware that shortly before her arrest, law enforcement released an affidavit calling for Charlie's arrest, which the state attorney refused? What? I don't understand your question. Are you aware that there was an affidavit that was released by law enforcement calling for Charlie's arrest? I believe there was like a probable cause or, <coughs> excuse me, or something like that, yes, sir. And that was broadcast to the entire world, right? It was broadcast, yes, sir. And that was back in 2014, correct? I believe so, yes, sir, if that's when that I'm happened. sorry, that was back in 2016, correct? Yes, sir. At the time that he started to act kind of weird? Yes, sir. Also around that time, there were 60 Minutes, 2020, and Dateline specials, right? Yes, sir. And there was also this bump, right? Yes, sir. And after Katie's arrest, there was even more suggestion that Charlie somehow had some role in this, right? Yes, sir. By the way, you continued to be friends with him after that, right? Yes, sir.
Now, isn't it true that you stole from Charlie? No, not at all. Okay. It's not true that you took checks that were supposed to be made out to the business and took them for yourself? That's alleged in a lawsuit that's been dismissed. So. Was that lawsuit dismissed because Charlie Edelson got arrested? In I don't this know case, why I never hired an attorney because I wasn't worried about it. When was it dismissed? After his arrest in this case or before? I found out last week, so I don't, I don't know. I don't care. Do you think it was arrest? <laughs> do you think it was dismissed after he was arrested in this case? I, that's speculation on your part. I have no idea. I didn't think about it. Didn't lose any sleep over it. Was a lawsuit for hundreds of thousands of dollars? About two million dollars. But I don't have that anyway, so I didn't worry about it. Before he filed that lawsuit, he demanded that you repay him, right? I guess, if that's what he says. Well, did he text you and demand repayment? Yeah. He said he was going to start taking what you owed him out of your paychecks. Do you recall that? Yeah. And you didn't like that? No. <laughs> so, you thre so you threatened if he tried to recover any of the stolen money for you, you would go to law enforcement and tell him, tell them that you were that he was involved in Professor Markell's murder. I don't know if that's what I said verbatim at all. Well, let, let's see if I can refresh your memory. Do you recall saying to Dr. Adel, uh, Charlie Adelson, I don't owe you shit. I'll be on the phone with the FBI today. Get your affairs in order before prison punk. You're going to rot in jail, you mom, fag. Do you recall saying that? I mean, if you're reading it, then I did. You open your mouth and I will open mine. Watch, motherfucker. You're a miserable Jew and you're going to get what you deserve. Do you recall saying that? If you're reading it, then I said it. I dare you to threaten me again. I'll be on the phone with the FBI before you blink, you murderer. Do you remember saying that? Yep. Get fucked. I'm going to get you in jail. Do you remember saying that? I guess if it's in, if it's in there. You ever heard of a website on Facebook called True Crimes Blog, True Crimes Case, the Dan Markell case, Let's Discuss? You ever heard of that? Yes. You are just posting pictures of Charlie on that website this week, right? I don't know. You want me to show you them? What difference does it make? I don't, what does that have to do with anything? May I approach your honor? Does this refresh your recollection of a picture you posted of Charlie on that website just days ago? Yeah, it's a good picture. You say you have nothing to gain from this case and you don't really care and you don't want to be here, right? Right. Just on Tuesday, do you recall writing to someone, I want to propose a wager. Let's see who gets involved. The over and under on Life Plus, laugh out loud. Yeah. Yeah. You posted on there that you were going to help get this man a life imprisonment, right? I don't know that it suggested that I was helping him do anything. I was just speak, speaking my opinion, which that's free speech, and that's what all the other idiots on that thing do as well. So, I want to propose a wager over under on Life Plus. That's what you said. Yeah. No further questions. Move to strike Mr. Rashbaum's commentary. Members of the jury, you are to disregard the last statement concerning uh, from Mr. Rauschbaum as to the post on the social media site. No question, Your Honor. You may step down. Thank you. Please call your next witness. Should we approach on that one, Your Honor? You may.
report you out briefly, and then we'll continue with the testimony. Okay. Jerry is exiting. Please rise. Everyone can be seated. How long will it take to get them in place? We'll go back on in 10 minutes and then the defense can take its proffer as to the issue that's already been addressed at the sidebar. We'll bring the jurors back in. Looks like time-wise, Mr. Rauschbaum, um, I know I didn't want to cut off your access of getting started on any cross-examinations, but do you wish to start your cross today or move into next week? I, I think, I mean, I don't know when they're going to be, but probably next week. Very but, well. But if, it, if they're quick, then maybe I would start today. Can we just go sidebar after? And... That's fine. Okay. All right, we'll resume in 10 minutes at 4.23.
back in session. Everyone can be seated. You may be seated. Mr. Rashbaum, you can go ahead with the proffer of the witness. Mr. Rivera, let me swear you in at this point. Please raise your right hand, sir. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give will be the truth? I say the truth. You may take your seat. Mr. Rivera, how are you? All right. In 2014, 2015, you were a member of the Latin Kings, is that right? Yes. And that's a uh, violent gang? No, we have family. It's, it's a gang, right? Yeah, it's a gang. It's a family, though. In fact, uh, you were head of the North Miami branch of Latin Kings, right? Yes, sir. That's the questions I have, Your Honor. Thank you. Ms. Kaplan, do you have anything to raise concerning this in light of what has been proffered as the theory of defense? No, Your Honor. I'm still objecting to relevance. As this specifically goes to the defendant's theory of defense, I will permit the line of questioning that has been raised. However, Mr. Rauschbaum, you are being cautioned as to going into any matters that are collateral to your theory itself. Do you understand where the line is? I understand, Your Honor. Let's bring in the jurors. Everyone except for Mr. Rivera may be seated. Mr. Rivera, I'm going to swear you now in front of the jury. Please raise your right hand, sir. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give will be the truth? I swear. You may take your seat. <coughs> you may examine when ready. What is your name, sir? Louis Rivera. Mr. Rivera, where are you from? Miami. I'm Puerto Rican, but raised in Miami. All right, and I see you're wearing a jail uniform. Have you been convicted of a felony? Yes, ma'am. How many times? I don't remember. Five Once. sound right? Forty-five, yeah. All right, and are you currently incarcerated? Yes, ma'am. Are you serving a sentence for both this case that we're here about and also a federal case? Yes, ma'am. All right, let's start with the federal case. What is the nature of that charge? Conspiracy Rico with the Latin Kings. Conspiracy Rico, like a racketeering? Yes, ma'am. And that's related to your involvement with the Latin Kings? Yes, ma'am. Is that a gang? Gang, family. Okay. And that was a group that you were affiliated with when you lived in Miami? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And we've heard that when some incidents occurred during this case, you were incarcerated in Broward County. Were you incarcerated in Broward County back in 2016? No. You were never in Broward? 2016? Yeah. No, I was in the feds. Okay. So you were incarcerated, but not in Broward, that was part of the ruse that you were. Yeah, I was. In I was in Broward, but I was 2016. I was in the feds. I was in Coleman. All right. So at the time of the what we're calling the bump, you were actually in federal custody. Yes, ma'am. And is that on the racketeering case? Yes, ma'am. You're still serving a sentence on that case. Absolutely. Okay. And is that case in any way related to the murder that we're here about today? No, ma'am. All right. So when law enforcement came to talked to you and identified you as a suspect in the murder case, you were already serving this sentence unrelated. Is that right? Yes, ma'am. Have you been promised anything in reference to that federal case no, for your testimony here today? No. 
All right. Have you ever gotten any help on the federal case for your cooperation in this case? No, ma'am. All right. What did you get for your cooperation in this case? Uh, this case, the murder case, um, 19 years. All right. And was the 19 years to be served concurrently or at the same time with the federal sentence you're already served? Concurrently with the same time as the feds. And what is your release date once you conclude both sentences? Both sentences, probably 2032, 33. 32 or 33? 2032 or 2033? Yeah. Okay. And what is it that you have to do in exchange for this 19 year sentence on the murder case? How to testify. All right. And what do you have to testify to? The murder. All right. And are you, has anyone told you to say anything other than the truth in the case? No, ma'am. Have I or anyone promised you anything other than what we've already discussed, the sentence you got? No, ma'am. Anybody ever told you that you had to testify about a specific person in order to get a deal? No, ma'am. talk about how you came to be a participant in the murder of Dan Markell. Did you participate in his murder? Yes, ma'am. How is it that you came to be a part of that? From a friend. And who's your friend? Garcia. Who's Garcia? Is that Sigfredo Garcia? Sig Sigfredo Garcia, yes. How did you know him? Childhood. And would you had you described him as a brother previously? Yes, ma'am. Is that because he was in the gang or no, he just... Was He's not in no gang. He was not in a gang, oh. but he was a good enough friend that you referred to him as yes, a brother. And back around the time that this crime occurred in 2014, were you and Mr. Garcia together all the time? Yes, ma'am. And Mr. Garcia, is he the one that came to you with the information about this job that needed to be done? Absolutely. And I say job, is that what this murder was to you? Yes, ma'am. So your motive for coming to Tallahassee and participating in this murder was money? Yes, ma'am, absolutely. Did you, did you know Dan Markell? Nope. Did you know anything about him? Nope. All right, so do you know why Garcia or how Garcia came to know about this murder or this job? His girl. Who's that? Katie. All right, so am I correct that Katie hired Garcia and Garcia hired you? Yes, ma'am. And who was to actually come to Tallahassee to do the murder? It was me and him. You and Garcia? Yes, ma'am. But not Katie? No. So she stayed in Miami? Yes, ma'am. All right, and who was to get the money once the, the job was done? Katie. All right, and did she get the money? Yes, ma'am. Do you know where she got the money from? Mm, do you my... know where she got the money from? Yeah, the people. She Wait, got a, who are the people? The dentist. I called them the dentist at that time. The dentist? Like when, uh, Wendy and her brother. Okay, and, and do you know which one of them actually handed Katie the money? No, absolutely not. And you weren't there for that? No, ma'am. So Katie went to get the money from the people, which includes both of them. Yes, ma'am. And then brought it back to you? Yes. Okay, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Did you originally describe the purpose behind this murder as helping a lady in Tallahassee get her kids? What you mean? Were you, did you describe the, I know your purpose was money, yeah. but whoever did the hiring had a different <coughs> purpose, right? Yes. And what was your understanding of that purpose? For the kids. To get these kids. To get the kids back. Okay. And do you know any more about that? Which family member did what and whose kids they were or anything like that? No, I don't think I know the kids was um, Wendy, that's mm -hmm. her name. Wendy, they're Wendy's kids? Yeah, that's the only thing I know. Okay, and it had something to do with getting Wendy's kids? Yes, ma'am. Do you know the dentist? No. Have you ever met the dentist before? No. Nope. What did the dentist have to do with the lady in Tallahassee that had the kids? That's her brother. And what was his connection to you or to Garcia? To me, nothing. His connection was, that was Katie's boyfriend. All right, so Katie was Garcia's child's mother? Yes, ma'am. 
and also was dating Charlie Adelson? Absolutely. Did you know before you before the murder was committed, did you know how much you were going to be paid? No. When did you find out how much you were going to be paid? When we was driving up. Okay, so that was before the murder was committed. Yeah, right? yeah, I'm sorry, yeah, yeah. All right, and so when you were driving up, you found out the job was going to pay how much for you? Well, they only gave me $37,000. $37,000? Yes, ma'am. And how much was the total bill for the job? It was a hundred grand. And that was split between who? Three ways. You and who else? Me, Garcia, and Katie. Was this job in any way related to your gang affiliation? No, absolutely not. <clears throat> Let me show you State's Exhibit. Shouldn't I have photos? Oh. Mm -hmm. I'll show you 37 and 38. Mm -hmm. You recognize these photos? Yeah. Are those photos of the folks that were involved in this homicide? Yep. Plus yeah. another young lady, who's that? That's my baby mama, she's not involved. Okay, and what's her name? Jessica Rodriguez. All right, Judge, at this time I'd ask to move into evidence 37 and 38. Any objection? No objection. States 37 and 38 are admitted. <coughs> Publish 37 at this time, please. You may. Thank you. <coughs> Who's that on the far left in the green shirt? Garcia. Okay, and next to him? Katie. And next to her? Jessica. And then that's you on the right? Yes, ma'am. When was this photo taken? Let me ask you this, was it before or after the homicide? Hmm. If you know. I can't remember. Did you previously say it was taken sometime after the homicide? I can't remember. I can't remember. Okay. States 38. Who are these folks? That's me and Garcia. Okay. Did Mr. Garcia go by any nicknames? Tuto. And what about you? Did you have a nickname? Tato. Had you ever been to Tallahassee before you came for this murder? No, ma'am. Did you come to Tallahassee one time or more than one time? Twice. And both times, was that with just you and Garcia? Yes, ma'am. Both times, did you come in a rental car? Yes, ma'am. How long had, can we go back to... How long had Catherine Magbanoa and Sigfredo Garcia been, I guess, on again, off again? Probably like 10 years. So at the time of this homicide, they'd been on and off for t about 10 years? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So you knew her pretty well as far as through Garcia, right? Yes, ma'am. And did she go by Katie sometimes? Yes, ma'am. Judge, may I publish 
Mr. Rivera, have you seen this exhibit before? Yes, ma'am. And have you had an opportunity to take a look at the phone numbers associated with the people on this chart that you know? I've seen them, but I don't remember none of them. Don't remember those numbers? Have you previously testified about the numbers? No, maybe one of them. I think it was probably okay. mine. Okay. Did you have an opportunity to look at the rental contract that you filled out for the rental car that was used in this homicide, the yes. Prius? All right. And that contract has your phone number on it, correct? Yes. And if that phone number matches the one up there, would that be the correct number for you at that time? Or at least one of them? Probably one of them. I have multiple phones, though. So. Yeah, you had a couple phones, right? Yeah. The address that was on the rental contract. Can I see the rental contract, Oh, it is. One moment, I'm going to show it to you. It's Normandy. Something in Normandy. Normandy. Is that where you were living at the time of the murder? No. I was just on my license. You provided your driver's license to rent the car? Yes, ma'am. And you know what the rental contract is? Never mind, I just found it. Okay, and at the time on your license, I'm approaching with States 58. It had this 1805 Normandy Drive on your license. Yes, ma'am. Where were you actually living at that time? I was living with Jessica. Okay, and was Jessica's address at 1515 Northeast 135th, yeah. number 14? Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right, so I want to talk about the first trip. Do you know the date that you left to come here for the first trip? No, ma'am. Does June 4th of 2014 sound correct? Probably. All right. How did you get here? Who drove? I drove. He drove half and I drove the other half. All right. The first so time. you both did some of the driving? Yes, ma'am. All right. And how did you know where you were going? Oh, well, he knew his way. Who did? Garcia. How did he know his way? Uh, he had a piece of paper with a with a with an address in the picture. What kind of what can you describe what the piece of paper was? A regular like? piece of paper. Like a regular piece of paper like this size? Yes, ma'am. Was it white? Yes. Was it like this kind of paper that goes in a printer? Yes, ma'am. And what was printed on it? It was an uh the the dude's address. Okay. Was the address printed or handwritten if you know? Man, I can't remember. Okay. Did it have a photograph on it? Yeah. All right. So it had a photograph and a, an address. Anything else written on there? That's it. Or typed? Not that I remember. Okay. So that's how you knew who you were supposed to kill and where that person lived? Yes, ma'am. So you didn't get the address from the prof's blog? No. Do you, you don't read the prof's blog? No. We you know that? Are you on the prof's blog server list? No.
Will Mr. Garcia get any information about Mr. Markell from a blog? No. Did either of you, to your knowledge, go on the computer and look on his Facebook? No, ma'am. Or search him in any kind of way? Not at all. All right. So everything you did, you did from this piece of paper? Yes, ma'am. Did you go to the address on the paper on the first trip? Yes, ma'am. Were you able to see Professor Markell that, that trip? No. What did y'all do that trip? We tried to follow him, but I lost. we lost him. But All right, so you saw his vehicle? Yes, ma'am. And tried to follow it? Yes, ma'am. Do you remember where you followed it that, that trip? Not that trip. I don't think I remember. Okay. Did you watch his home? sit and watch his home during yes, that first trip? Did anybody get out of the car and look around or poke around his property? Yes, ma'am. Who did that? Garcia. Why did the murder get done on this trip? Man, I can't remember. Did you have a weapon with you? Hmm. I think we had, I don't, I don't remember. Did you previously say that you each had a firearm on both trips? Yeah. Okay, do you remember where, which weapon was the murder weapon? Yeah, I remember the murder, the, the weapon. How, where did the murder weapon come from? I got it. Where did you get it from? On the streets. All right, and was that in Miami or up here? Miami. Okay, so you went and got a weapon, was that specifically for the purpose of yes, committing this mur murder? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma and was, did that weapon come up here on the first trip with you? I think so. All right, and was there another firearm in the car as well? We had two. Okay, whose gun was the other one? Garcia. And the murder weapon, what type of weapon was that? 38. Oh, is that a revolver? Yes, ma'am. All right. Was there a particular plan as far as who was going to actually do the murder? I was supposed to do it. Okay, and was it always going to be a shooting? It's going to be a shooting. What was the plan? Were you always going to do it in his car, or what? Was there any kind of plan? No, it wasn't no plan, really any plan, nothing out. So it was just going to be, if there if an opportunity arose, you were if going to take it. If there was an opportunity, we just we do what we got to do and go. What if an opportunity arose when the children were present? I was not doing that in front of the kids. Okay. Not me. Did somebody instruct you on that, or that was just a given that you weren't going to do it? I was not going to do it. Period. On that first trip, when you were discussing this murder and the payment, was there any conversation about maybe switching it to a robbery? Yes. All right, and who brought up the possibility of switching it from a murder to a robbery? Me. And what was your suggestion? My suggestion was to go back and rob the lady. And who's the lady? Wendy. Okay, because did you believe at that time that Wendy was the one that had this money to pay for the murder? Yes, ma'am. All right, so your thought was, hey, let's just take the money. Let's take the money. Don't even have to do a murder, right? We don't have to do none of that. And why why didn't that happen instead of the murder? He told me he can't. He just, he just had to do his job. I'm like, I just went with it because I was my friend, so I just went with the... Garcia what? told you that, that you had to get this job done. Yes, ma'am. And the job had to be done for Katie, right? Yes, ma'am. All right, so let's talk about the second trip. Is that when the murder happened, July 16th through the 18th? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And that's the rental, rental car agreement that I already showed you. That was the Prius you traveled up here in? Absolutely, yes. And we talked about your phone number, but there's another phone number on that rental agreement that says brother. Is that Garcia's phone number? I don't remember. Okay. Who would be the brother that you would put on the rental contract as going with you? Garcia. Did you take phones with you when you came to Tallahassee? Cell phones? Yeah. And did you have the phones on or off for the actual homicide? It was off at that moment. And did you take the same guns with you that second trip? Yes, ma'am. 
Where did you stay while you were here? In a hotel. Was there an incident while you were here for that trip prior to the actual murder where one of the guns was discharged in the Prius? Yes, ma'am. Could you tell us what happened? Well, the gun went off. Well, Garcia was playing with the gun. I was driving, and he put a hole right through the floor in the passenger side. Were you actually out on the roads yes, when this happened? Yes, ma'am. I was driving. And did it have an impact on the your ability to drive the car? Yeah, it hit the, uh, the gas line. All right. So what? how'd you get it fixed? Oh, uh, he, uh, he flagged somebody down there. <clears throat> we met the first time, some people. And they gave, they gave him a ride to the to the auto zone to get a a piece of hose to connect it back. So somebody gave you a ride to the auto zone. Yes, ma'am. Not me, him. Vers- I was in the car. I never got off the car. All right, you stayed with the disabled vehicle. Yes, ma'am. And did Garcia come back and do something to the car? Yeah, he fixed it. All right. And it was able to be op- operated after that. Yes, ma'am. Did y'all follow Dan Markell at all during this second trip? Yes, ma'am. Where did you follow him this time? Follow him to the daycare and to the gym. Was there a reason that the murder had to get done on the day it did? It was just the right thing, the right opportunity, I guess. Okay. Did you have any information that the victim was going to be leaving town the day after the homicide occurred? Yes, ma'am. Your Honor, meeting. The answer struck? The answer is not struck. You need to rephrase your question. All right. So, how did you find out that the victim was leaving town the following day? Uh, I can't remember that good. Was it from a blog? Objection, Your Honor. Leading. It's not leading, Your Honor. Was it from a blog? Yes, ma'am. Okay. What blog was that? The blonde was Wendy. No, I was I was saying mean? from the computer. Did you research oh, no, it on no, the computer? Oh no, 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 no. Okay, so somebody gave you the information. Yeah, somebody. It was a person. A person. And and how did you actually talk to the person? No, ma'am. Who talked to the person? Tuto, Gar- Garcia. Garcia talked to the person. Talked to All Katie. Right. Okay, so Garcia got the information from Katie. Yes, ma'am. And do we know where Katie got it from? I don't know. Okay, were you present when Garcia talked to Katie and found out yes, we got to do it today? Yes, ma'am. He was on the phone. <coughs> I'm sorry? That was on the phone speaking. He was talking to Katie on the phone? Yes, ma'am. And you were present for that? I was in the car. Okay. Who was driving the green Prius on, like, whenever you were following Mr. Markell right before the murder? Me. Did you go to, I think you said the daycare. Where else did you go that day? The gym. Have you seen the video surveillance from the gym in this case? I have seen it now. Yeah, where the green Prius is at the gym. Have you Uh, seen that? I have seen it. And is that you driving that Prius? Yes, ma'am. Okay, is Garcia in the vehicle as well? Absolutely. All right. Did you know whether or not the kids were in the car at the time you were at the gym? No, he dropped them off. I seen him when he dropped them off in the daycare. So you actually saw the kids go into the daycare? Yes, ma'am. So was it after the daycare that you proceed to the gym? Yes. And what about after that? We followed him to his house. All right, so did you wait in the car while the victim went into the gym and worked out? Yes, ma'am. And did y'all know at that time, like, we're going to do it when he comes out no. of the gym, or not necessarily? Not necessarily, no. So you're just following him to see where he goes? To see where he goes. And where did he go? To his house. Did you see the bus video that shows the Prius shortly before and shortly after the homicide? Yes, ma'am. And was that, were you driving the vehicle at that time? Yes, ma'am. Tell us what happened when you got to Mr. Markell's driveway. Well, he had, he had turned a uh, yeah, he turned the block before. We kept going, so we went to in front of his house. So when he pulled in, we pulled in right behind. I pulled in right behind him. Is what you're describing, you entered his street from two different directions? Yes, ma'am. 
All right, and and you met at his. Did you meet at his driveway? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so you pull in behind him. What happens next? Rusty, I jumped out and shot him. How many times? Twice. Where was he standing when he fired the shots? Right, um, right in front of the driver's side, right in, by the driver. Did you see what the victim did during this attack? He put his hands up. How was it decided that Mr. <clears throat> Garcia would end up being the shooter instead of the original plan, which was for you to do it? I, wasn't gonna, I was driving. I, ain't, I had no time. He jumped out and did it. Okay. He had the gun the whole time. All right. So either one of you were willing to do it when whoever wasn't driving when the opportunity arose? <clears throat> Maybe, but it was... It was really his job, so he took, he did, he did it. You mean he, why was it his job? He's the one that we was getting paid, but he knew about the whole thing. Well, you were getting paid too, right? Yeah, but I. But he secured the job. Yes, ma'am. The bus video that we looked at, one of them shows the passenger side, someone in a white shirt moving around a lot right after the homicide. Can you explain to the jury what was going on in the car at that time? He was trying to hide the gun. And that's Garcia? Garcia. Where did he put the gun? Right on the front arm. Um, in the passenger side, right under the rug. Okay. What ultimately happened with the gun? We threw it away. Where? In the river. On the way back to South Florida? Yes, ma'am. Is that where y'all went when you left Tallahassee? Yes, ma'am. When did you turn your cell phones back on? In between my own right, I think right away, I think. After leaving Tallahassee? Yeah. If I remember, I really don't remember, but it, it got turned on. Sometime after the murder, they got turned back on? Yeah. Okay. Do you remember what, who made the first phone call out of the two of you? Uh, I didn't make no phone call. He did. Who did he call? I think he called Katie. Well, he called Katie. He so called Katie. Did? He called Katie. He called Katie. And were you able to hear the conversation with Katie? Yes, ma'am. And what was that conversation? He told her everything is done. She like, I know, and um, he like, where the money? Okay, let me back you up just a little bit. How did she know it was done? I think she, she got a phone call right away before we did. All right, but somehow she indicated she knew. Yes. All right, and what? And you asked about the money. Did you personally ask about the money, or was that Garcia? That's Garcia. What did she say about the money? You'll get it tomorrow. Did you get it tomorrow? Yes, ma'am. On the way back from um, Tallahassee to Miami, did you stop in Pembroke Pines at a an ATM machine? No way back. Yeah. I know we stopped. I'll show you states 39 through 45. Have you seen these before? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I see it. I see them. And are these AT appear to be ATM yes, images? Ma yes, ma'am. And what's the date on the ATM images? 7 18, 2024. 2024? I mean, 14, sorry. <laughs> All right, that's the day of the murder, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay, is this the green Prius that y'all came to Tallahassee in? Yes, ma'am. All right, are these fair and accurate photographs of you in the in the green Prius on the day of the homicide? Yes, ma'am. Permission to introduce and publish states 39 through 45. Any objection? There you are. 39 through 45 are admitted. Permission to publish? You may. States 39 
one, please? Make that bigger, please. Who's pictured in this exhibit, Mr. Rivera? That's me and Garcia. That's, who's that in the foreground, closer to the camera? That's me, I'm the driver. Okay. 42, please. Who's that in the passenger seat? Garcia. 43, please. Did you and Sigfredo Garcia go out that night when you got back to Miami? Yes, ma'am. Do you remember where you went? I went, then went to a bar. Was Catherine McBano with you that night? No, I don't think so. Do you know where she went that night? No, I don't know. All right. The next morning, is that when you saw her again? Yes, ma'am. All right. Tell us what happened the next morning. The next morning, I woke up. I went to the barber shop. And um, she went to my house and took the money. She had the money at your house? Yeah. And did you go home and get it? Yes, ma'am. Did you go home with some purpose? My purpose to pick that money up. Yeah, why were you, were you worried about the money? I was worried about my baby mama taking it. You were worried about your baby mama taking it? Yes, ma'am. Is that Jessica, the one we saw in the, yes, in the photo? Yes, ma'am. So if she'd seen that money? If she would have seen it, she would have probably took it. <laughs> okay. But she never seen it. How much money was in there? 37. I think it was 35, 000? 35, 35. 35,000. And was, how was it packaged? A hundred staples. All hundred dollar bills? Yes, ma'am. And what do you mean by staples? They were all staples. It was a thousand dollars, each thousand dollar staple in the top corner. All right, so you got 35,000. I think you previously said you got 37. Where did the other two come from? Garcia gave it to me. Why did he do that? Just gave it to me. So he just gave you two additional stacks out of his cut? Yes, ma'am. Do you know how much he got versus how much Katie got? No. Can you not no. remember that? I don't remember. Okay, but it added up to 100. Is that what you previously yes, said? Yes, ma'am. Did you buy anything with the your cut of the money? Just a motorcycle. Approach you with states 46 and 47. Is that a picture of the motorcycle you bought with the murder money? That's Garcia's. That's Garcia's. What about 47? Is that yeah. your motorcycle there? That's mine, yeah. Okay, and this is Garcia's. Garcia. And then what about this Monte Carlo in the background? Did y'all buy that too? That's Garcia's. He got it. Did he buy that with the murder money? Or after the murder? Shortly yeah. after the murder? Yeah, something like that. All right. Are these fair and accurate photos of those vehicles? Yes, ma'am. Judge, at this time, I'd ask to move into evidence states 46 and 47. Any objection? No objection. States 46 and 47 are admitted. Can I publish 46, Your Honor? You may. And 47, please. Did you make any changes to your cell phone after the murder? Do you remember? I don't remember. Did you meet with investigator Jason Newland with my office to look at this, what I've marked as state 63, this exhibit regarding the calls in this case? Yes, ma'am. And do these initials next to these calls indicate that you've authenticated the voices that are highlighted? Yes, ma'am. Judge, I'd ask to move into evidence state 63. Any objection? No objection. Okay. State 63 is admitted. So you were able to recognize the voices of Catherine Magbanawa and Sigfredo Garcia on those call, those recordings? Yes, ma'am.
Have you ever had any kind of contact with any member of the Adelson family? No, ma'am. During the time that Catherine McBanel was dating the dentist, were you around her during that time? I mean, I've seen her a few times. Okay, and what was the context of, like, what was the occasion that you would see her if she was with the dentist? No, not with him, but I've seen her when she come to for Garcia. Okay, so if she was doing something related to the kids or something yeah, like that? Yeah, that's it. During the times that you saw her while she was dating the dentist, did she ever brag to you about the dentist at all? No, ma'am. Did she ever tell you the dentist has a lot of money? No, ma'am. The dentist has a safe full of cash in his home? No. So do you even know who the dentist is? I mean, do you know who he is here never in the met courtroom? Him, never met him in my life until today. Okay. Well, the dentist lawyers have indicated that you and Garcia got this idea on your own to come to Tallahassee <laughs> and kill the professor. Is that true? No. A good one. Did you kill him and then try to get Katie to blackmail the dentist? No. When you suggested to Sigfredo Garcia on the way up that it would be easier to just do a robbery, would it have been easier to rob the dentist back in Miami than to come up here to do a murder? I never said nothing about him because I don't know him, but I said, let's go rob the lady. Right. Just like if, that. If you had known that it was actually the dentist that had the money, would you have been just as happy to rob the dentist? Absolutely. Would that have been less trouble than coming to Tallahassee to do a murder? Yes, ma'am. One moment, please, Your up this point. Cross-examination of the witness will take place by the defense on Monday morning. Once again, I'm going to give you the same instruction that I've given throughout. You're not to discuss this case with each other or anyone else. Do not watch the news coverage. Do not seek out any information about this matter. Have a restful weekend. We will see you on Monday morning. Please report at 830. Enjoy your weekend, Mr. Rauschbaum. The juvenile concert awaits. Can't, I can't wait. <laughs>